usually it has a check mark it, underneath that says it, turn on auto gain on or off and you it was off it, it was okay. on but i normally have it off now it's perfect now it's off again okay so now it shouldn't auto gain on me and yeah drop down level one okay 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 so now we're good now we're good now we're good now we're good and check check sorry guys excellent good job no, Perfect. we do this. We do this every day, so it's no problem. Thank you, Arshid. Appreciate the assist sure, there. No Didn't want to meet you all that way. All right. I don't know if you're on Unity's yet, Zach. We're raising our thumbs uh, for Chad in the background. Okay, you got it. I'm not sure Zach is on Unity. Okay, if you look in that little circle there, Zach, uh, in the pie that says panel, just make sure you click it so it turns blue in that slice. I know it's the weirdest interface on the planet, but... Uh, oh, it's weird. It came through for me in the pre-check, but uh, now it's blue. There you go. I was thinking it's interesting. Everybody hates that UI. You are good. Yeah, it's the world's worst. I don't, I don't mind it at all. I, I always kind of chuckle every time everybody complains about it. I know Alex hates it. It's okay. That's fine. Makes sense. Thank you, Chad. Uh, we're about two and a half minutes away from showtime. The Unity client has some weird quirks. If you power cycle your audio interface while the app is open, it will not automatically reestablish the connection. It'll, it will go back to the built-in sound card whatever it is on the computer at least that was my experience with it no you're right alexander it's a uh, a little niggling detail hey zach where are you from i'm from philadelphia i'm originally from syracuse but um yeah i'm in philadelphia near mitch actually i know i know where mitch is well, it's good to have you on the panel. Welcome. Thank you. It's nice to meet you. I really, this show has been transformational for me, and I appreciate all of your uh, contributions. And on the uh, Mukana, just make sure you're set to on deck. That'll give you the list of questions in the order that the question manager is placing them. Just hit the tab. Sorry, I had to brush my hair. It was a little bit unruly. I'll show about probably five minutes of pictures at the second hour and then let everybody else jump in, just to get everybody moving. And then uh, copy. Hopefully that'll get the questions turning. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do at officehours.global. Our first hour is general discussion. Second hour is usually something we want to spend a little bit more time on. Today, we're going to talk about fly kits, what they are, how they're built, things that you want to think about when you're building them. So if you've got questions about that, this is a great day for you. It's so great that you were here. You, you showed up at the right day. So um, so jump in and throw those questions in for the second hour. And we'll show a little bit. We've got some great experts here uh, that I know have built a lot of fly kits. So, so I think this is going to be an excellent second hour. All right, let's go ahead and jump into the questions. Mitch, what do we have? 
Thank you, Alex. Uh, first in is Scott Mueller from Germantown, New York, asking, my home setup has ATEM Extreme ISOs. I'm going to be implementing Zoom ISO, Deck Links, Companion, and VMix into an event trailer with a 1ME 4K and smart video hub. What's different about the 1ME from the Extreme SDI? Will my workflow differ much? Yeah, it doesn't have a super source. <laughs> so, so you're, you're going to be bummed. Um, so the 1ME does not have a super source. You need the 2ME uh, to do the super source. And so uh, I would never build a kit. I've owned probably 10 1MEs. So it's not that I've never owned a 1ME, but I would never use one again. Um, you know, so I, I think that it's cute for like, I want to switch a simple show, but if you want to do anything of, of value, you're going to need a 2ME. So you got to decide whether you're going to really need 4K uh, or, or HD, um, but you're going to, you know, that's the one of me is kind of not having the super source is a real killer. Like I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend buying a switcher like for professional for a truck or a trailer uh, without a super source. Uh, go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, plus one on what Alex said about the super source. But the other good thing is if you get it with SDI, you're going to have locking connectors on the back of the unit. It's going to be so much easier than trying to mess around with. Uh, oh, he's HDMI. got that already. He's got the yeah. SDI. He's got an extreme SDI right now. So he's got so he's got the SDI already. Um, it's just a matter of whether he, you know he's going to go to this to a more rack mountable solution, which totally makes sense. But you don't want to give up your super source. Go ahead, Chris. With the with the video hub, you could probably duplicate feeds over to the the extreme also uh, there might be some delay i also want to point out that alex painful. said Al, uh, yeah it would be i i want to point out that alex said uh i've owned about 10 of them and i would never buy another one it's not that it took alex 10 times before he realized oh foiled by this thing again <laughs> you probably bought them all at once is my I guess i bought okay. six of them at one time i wanted everybody to understand that it doesn't take alex 10 times to learn a lesson yeah. All right. yeah, no we, we did a we did a game so what the reason i had so many um we had a couple of them and and here's the reality is before mix effect pro a lot of this has to do with mix effect pro before mix effect pro we didn't care about the super sources because it was so hard to program them that we would you know we hit, we did very few shows with super sources before mix effect because it was such a it's still if you don't have mix effect pro on a on a atem that has super source it's almost unusable so we didn't really think about it that way we just designed shows around not having that or doing maybe one or whatever it didn't really matter in fact um the reason we have so many of those one mes is because we did a gaming show. In fact, I think we bought eight of them. We had eight gamers, and we wanted to be able to do all the super source stuff, but we didn't want to bother the, the the TD with it. So we had an assistant TD that was able to kind of do DVEs and super sources and everything else of each gamer. Each gamer had their own switcher, so that we could sit there and design each of their things. And then, and then, so what it did is it created essentially an eight me, you know, system. Um, but each one would have. But we were doing DVEs on top of it, and then we were able to. Uh, what was great for the gamers what you know the gamers would just sit there and do their thing and then the, the td just cut between the gamers but we were designing each frame for each one of them um so that we didn't have to animate anything and that we didn't have to fiddle with the switcher but so we got them and we you know there's lots of events that you can do without a super source but i would never put it into a trailer <laughs> like like that would that would be crazy uh go ahead mitchell yeah and also having uh, the super source means you can control it with a stream deck with uh, mix effect which is great I mean, to literally have a remote control that does 90% of what yeah. you need to do. Yeah, no, absolutely. All right, next question. Sean Johnson from New York asking, looking to purchase a portable 5G hotspot to use as a backup for if and when my main ISP goes down. Found a few devices that have built-in SIMs and pay-as-you-go data plans. Anyone have experience with this or suggestions for devices? Thanks. Go ahead, uh, Oliver. Well, I <clears throat> I, um, I use an industrial um, RUT um, uh, Teltonics uh, device that's built in, usually built into trucks and stuff, and I have a, a very nice uh, external antenna for that, so it has a lot of gain. But uh, a lot of people I talked to um, recently, they just get um, uh, uh, Starlink, and uh, that that is sort of um superseding any 5g uh things the only of course obvious disadvantage is that you need uh, a clear field of sight to the heavens and so you might want to need or you need might want you might need to move it somewhere um 
where you uh, where it's a little tricky to get to. But um, you know, that's I, I would I would I would certainly check that out um, uh, if I had the uh, need yeah, for the, for that. Big challenge we've had with Starlink is being able to get a three hundred and sixty view of the or a one hundred and eighty view of the sky. You know, like there's just a lot of places we can't put it. That's been the, the challenge for us. Thank you, Bill. Yeah, for me, and and I'm really looking forward to what Keenan has to say about this because I know he does this a ton, but I just wanted to address the data plan. They say it's got a pay-as-you-go data plan, which is one of the ones that I like. Generally, I'd prefer that to a fixed subscription. Uh, to me, it's whether you've got a dripping faucet, uh, a faucet drip that you can turn off versus a persistent drip. I hate the persistent drip model that once your money is going out, it just keeps going out whether you use the service or not. But if you've got a... a valve on there and can turn it off. I find that to be a very good model. So uh, I just want to control that drip coming out of my bank account whenever I can. Go ahead, Kenan. Well, there's there's several ways to do it. The pay as you go is actually good because you're using it as a backup. I would recommend the unit from the disaster group. Sorry, shameless plug, but we created this for disaster use. It works great for um, people that need it when they need it, it comes with two gig of data a month. So you have some testing and it's a very small monthly fee. So I'll just put a link in the chat, but this really is three carriers. So it's better than a hotspot and, uh, has AWS bonding. So that's, that's definitely the way I would go. And how many, how, how many, just how many, uh, SIMs did you say it had? Or does it have any? So it has, it comes pre-activated uh -huh. with AT&T, T-Mobile and Verizon. Okay. And it's $35 a month. So That's that great. gives you two gig. You know, Guy and I did the calculations yeah, how, when, when we were at CES. How but, much do you pay per gig? Uh, $7.68. That's billed at the end of the month. So when Guy and I were talking at CES, there's a lot of our, our friends here that do productions. And you don't want to pay for unlimited data because nothing's truly unlimited. But if you're paying for it mm -hmm. wholesale... You can use as much data as you want. You're just going to incur a bill at the end of the month. So the model was that if you did, you know, certain a certain number of live streams a month, you could right. figure out what your data costs are going to be. So, yeah, yeah, because we paid to put it put it in perspective. I think we paid two thousand dollars a month for a live view. I mean, that's you know, now I charged six hundred dollars a use. <laughs> so, right. so as long as I used it uh, four times a, a month, which we used it ten times a month, so it was fine. But it was. But uh, it was to put in perspective of how much that that's nothing. I mean, what Keenan's charging is, I don't even know how you're doing that. Anyway, go ahead, Oliver. I just wanted to show um, the antenna I'm using because that's probably also a good point. Um, high gain antenna. So this is a dome antenna that they use to uh, mount on top of the of the trucks. And I just uh, ripped apart a cable drum half and mounted the. Uh, antenna on top of it and so i can use the cable drum to uh, store the cable and i can also use it to uh, put it on a flat surface somewhere so i don't have to carry around uh, you know any any mounting equipment or something so it's just i just put that into the nearest spot to a window or you know wherever there might be the best uh, reception and um it's it's uh, wi-fi antenna is also in there in there that allows me to um, make a Wi-Fi network, and it's also 5G or LTE antenna, so I have uh, good access to the internet. That's great. Um, go ahead, Chris. I just wanted to uh, mention the the Starlink solution. Uh, Alex, you were saying it's hard to get enough uh, uh, um, visibility of the sky. Obviously, if you're in you know a big city, that's going to be a big problem. But Keenan, you. I've been with Keenan a couple of times. Now, one time we were in the middle of the Black Rock Playa, which is all sky. I think it's sky is on wholesale there. But when we were in Mount Charleston, we still had good visibility, even though we were in the trees. Or, or was that a fairly okay clearing, Keenan? Well, in the rural areas with trees, yeah, we had a good view to the north. Now that they're doing the high performance dish, you can you're going straight up. So. The, the I guess the issues probably for Alex are if you're in the concrete jungle of large buildings, it's hard to get you. There's a lot of shadowing, things like that. Um, and I, I do recommend Starlink as a backup and I plug it into the LAN, the WAN port of my router and it works. So you can actually have three cellular and Starlink. Yeah. But you're right, line of sight. It's getting better every day as they improve their constellation. They're they're really adding more satellites that I think this is going to be a viability for for most productions as long as you can get a north or a uh, a straight up view. 
Yeah, I mean, the, the problem that we had really was is that we, you know, in my testing, I have one. Um, and the testing was is that it would just suddenly turn off for 45 seconds. You know, like it would just like it would be oh, between satellites or whatever. And it would just suddenly there'd be no bandwidth. And it would it was it'd be good for three or four hours and then 45 seconds of nothing. And so as a production person, I was like, well, I can't use that. As soon as, as, soon as I saw that, I was like, well, I, I canceled my subscription. I still have it sitting around. I might use it when they get more satellites. But I was just like, no, I can't 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 ever have that happen. You know, so um Anyway, next question. Craig Kadoki from Toronto, Canada. Craig is asking, has anyone tried the Rode AI Micro yet? It looks like it could be a handy little audio device. Go ahead, Oliver. I, I didn't try that, but uh, what threw me off is the AI in there, because that doesn't mean what I thought it means. It, uh, it doesn't mean artificial intelligence. It means just audio interface. So and Someone told them. Some, I'm sure someone told them. If you just put AI in there, you'll yeah. sell more. You'll sell more. <laughs> yeah, but I, w I was wondering uh, if when I saw this question, is I was wondering if anybody has seen a, a, a device made that has the AI stuff in it. Because uh, if you've ever tried Crisp, um, which is a little app that takes the audio and and does some AI stuff to it. It, it creates amazing um, results, uh, removing background noise. But I wonder why nobody has yet done a device that does that. And well, yeah, yeah, it's it's interesting. It's it's and the crisp this the crisp definitely works pretty well. Um, go ahead, go ahead, Bill. Yeah, so I took a look at this thing. It's uh, a cute little uh, interface. It's about seventy nine dollars US. It's kind of designed to be a mobile device, and it's designed for people I think who are starting out and want to do kind of live man on the street sort of stuff in a little simple modular unit. It auto senses whether something's TRS or TRRS for mics going in, so that's a little convenience. Uh, they say zero latency monitor. That's because you're just listening to what's in the box. It's not what your program out is. It has USB AC and Lightning connectors, which are all very good. The thing that bothered me, and, and as a professional, you know. You, you very seldom want to use just simple plug-in connections for anything mission critical. And I know that even on Sennheiser, some of their less expensive body packs that use TRRS, they actually have a locking collet that screws down to make sure that if as you're out in the field, those plugs don't disconnect. That's the kind of thing that is a symbol of the fact that they're intending the device for more robust use. These, I think this would probably do fine for somebody starting out. I'm not sure I would want to put it in my kit as a regular broadcaster. Go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, to Oliver's point, uh, I think they've uh, substituted the word DSP for AI because there's a little smarts in there. And to Oliver's question, uh, there are a couple of mics that are showing up DSP built into the mic itself. Uh, Logitech, I think, has one. And there's another one from a Russian manufacturer called Tula. Yeah, the um, uh, most of these, what's interesting is, is that most of the ones we've seen, we've bought, I don't know, 100 of these in the last two, two or three years of something like the AI. This is four times more expensive than all the other ones that we bought. And what I kept on thinking was, if someone just built one that was a little bit more fe full featured, <laughs> I would pay more for it. So when this question came up between the time the question was uh, asked and the beginning of the show, I bought one. So I should have one by su Sunday. <laughs> so maybe if you ask again next week, I'll have a, a stronger opinion about it. But we bought a lot of these Sabrent and, and Riser and Riser and a whole bunch of other ones that we've used for our kits. You know, for when you have cheap little microphones that you can that you want to throw in there, that these are having a solid one of these is would be useful. And it's been something we've had a lot of trouble with. Uh, next question. Paul Wallace in Austin, Texas asking, OpenAI now offers a $20 a month plan, which offers more availability during peak hours. Are you signing up? Uh, John? So Greg Brockman posted this on his blog, blog post two days ago, and they've got a link to a form where you have to fill it out, and then you'll get access to the link to upgrade. And I had to fill this form out three times before I finally got the link to upgrade. I did it last night, yes. So what did you have to do? What did... I, I had to form. fill that form out three times. That why, the form in the three? block, I don't know. Okay, it didn't. It didn't come the first two times, and then when I did it last night, oh, mine just said it'll bottom, send me. Eventually, it'll send me something. On the bottom left of the interface, it says upgrade uh -huh. your plan, and then you can and then you can put in your credit card. Very good. Go ahead, Bill. 
Yeah, I think this is a use case. But if you're really going to do a lot of open AI, and some of the people here are investigating it very robustly, I would think you'd save probably a lot of money and it'd be an easier thing to just go on a monthly plan. Plus, if they actually do give you more priority because you are a subscriber, that could be a big deal for a lot of people. For me, this is the kind of thing I would subscribe to play through with it for a couple of months and then forget about it, and it would be sitting there again. That'd be another drip out of my subscription bucket and I wouldn't do it. I, I, uh, that you can imagine that that probably the free version will become less available now that there's a paid version there. So the chances of you, if you actually want to use ChatGPT, chances of you using it more than an hour a day uh, without the subscription is going to be very low within three months, you know, like maybe zero. <laughs> like, so it just, it's too expensive to run these servers without people paying for them. So you want to reduce the num reduce the demand on the servers as well as making sure that they're generating revenue. Uh, so that's why I'm signing up. I use it all day, every day. <laughs> like it's not. It's not like I play with it. I, I am. I use it for recipes. I, was, I, I had to fill out what I had to use it for. And I was like, I felt a little embarrassed. I was like, recipes, um, and, you know, entertaining my friends. <laughs> like you know, we did. We we just we just, we spent a day. Like not a day. We spent. I say a day. We spent a cup. A uh, solid thirty minutes doing Chinese. Um, uh, fortune cookies, but in different things as Klingon, as Romulan, as uh, Star, you know, as Star Wars, as Jabba the Hutt, all, all kinds of things. And it just, it just plays right along. Um, but I also use it for thinking about scripting, coding, um, you know, thinking about what, what I find it really interesting is it's often if you know what you're talking about, because it can, it can very, it can be very assertive about things it knows nothing about. So you have to be, you have to know what you're doing. But if you want to summarize something for something, someone asks a question and you want to summarize it into three paragraphs or, or say something really quick, you can ask chat GPT and oftentimes it will give it to you better than you would have said it. And you might have to edit like three things in it to, to, to make sure that it's accurate, but it's, it, it's really good at being concise and, um, and oftentimes contextually accurate. Uh, go ahead, uh, Mitchell. Yeah, their scale up must be crazy because uh, they just got announced as being the fastest growing app in the history of the world yeah. with 100 million applications. Uh, uh, monthly active users, I think, is the, 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 is, is the Mao. Uh, next question. Next question in from Andre Dole in Berlin. Oliver, is it possible for Memo Live to get a visual preview of a complete layer set before recalling it to live? I only see the possibility to preview a layer in the stack. Go ahead, Oliver. Uh, yeah, I surely appreciate that I get the opportunity to answer questions on Memo Live on this panel, but I really don't want to, you know, hawk nope. the, the show no, for... No, no, absolutely. You can, <laughs> you can definitely answer the question. Yeah, that, you're here. The, uh, the, so you'll... Yeah, the, go ahead. <laughs> this question is, uh, is you know... Uh, is 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 tricky to answer because uh, the answer I mean the answer is very simple the answer is no so you can't uh, you don't have a preview and program separation like you do in a traditional switcher and uh, that was a conscious decision because we thought uh, it's not needed um, uh, if you are thinking software and um, because you can prepare pre-program everything so that you know what it looked like and um, you don't need to see it before you turn it live. And looking at uh, professional produced programs that use large um, switchers uh, with uh, the preview, I, I see many, many, many cases where people, um, you know, uh, miss switch, uh, you know, miss, miss, the, uh, miss, miss the stuff that's on the preview. And um, so, you know, we think that it makes it easier to operate um, uh, a, a switching or production if you don't have to do that. And um, there's a lot of thought that goes into automation and um, and um, uh, things that help you uh, define uh, what the output should look like upfront so you don't have to you know, create the look on the fly and preview it before you put it live. Um, yeah, it's, that's it's, the, it's, the long answer. <laughs> so. I will say I'm using Memo Live almost every day and, and doing a lot of R&D with it and, and putting things together. We, we do our, I'll do a show later today with it. Um, and, uh, but I will say that not having the preview is probably the thing that drives me the most crazy. <laughs> so, well, so like, because, yeah. and it's mostly because it says, I, I have this image and then it says, and then whatever's underneath it. And that 
I, I that the the number one error I make is the whatever's underneath is the thing that's that I don't see until I go live, and 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 I that makes me a uh, nutty. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, uh, uh, Oliver, your logic makes sense uh, in terms of like I've pre-built it. I know it's right. However, what you don't know is what is actually happening in front of your cameras. And that's where the logic falls apart. So it might be you want to wait until that person gets composited just right, and then you can take to it. So you, if it's possible, you may think about changing that. It may not be. I know you're, I know you're pushing the computer really hard. Next question. Next one in from Tobias Moss in Minneapolis. I just threw up some color accent lights for a gig last night in a well-lit room. They were slightly noticeable in person, but too strong on camera. Tips for pulling this off better? Is it possible to color accent well for both room and camera? And go ahead, Mitchell. Most definitely. Uh, typically, if you have a bright uh, background and you're throwing lights on, it's going gonna, it's gonna to compete with the light source you're using to put a little splash of color so uh, if you have the choice, uh, like an 18% gray is, a, is probably the very best way to do it because it's going to reflect the most color saturation uh, than a white wall would where you'd have to really hit it hard. Um, go ahead, Bill. Years ago, I was enjoying a Phoenix Suns basketball game and I went out for snacks and I was walking on the cons course and I was looking at a scene that happened to be on camera on the broadcast at the same time. And so I saw the broadcast on a monitor and I was looking at the real scene and it shocked me because the projected graphics in the concourse were barely visible to my eye, but on camera they were perfect. And that was the day I learned the lesson that cameras and human eyes do work differently in a lot of circumstances. So I am a 100% believer that if you're going to try to do projected graphics Put it on a monitor and see what it actually looks like being broadcast. Don't rely on what you think it's going to look like, because sometimes it can be very, very different. Go ahead, Chris. Light for the biggest audience. That's what I would recommend. Yeah, and and you know there are there are a couple things um, that it depends on the camera angle as well. So a lot of times you'll see lights at a certain camera angle to the to the um, when they're going towards the the, the camera in a way that, in a different way. So. Um, where your camera's positioned will also um, greatly depend on it. We've had things where we have an enormous number of lights. We don't see any of them in the camera because of their angle of incidence to the camera. Also, if there's, uh, you'll tend to both see them in both locations if there is a little bit of haze. So in events that we do that like that, we might have a hazer um, that that kind of a a water-based hazer, not an oil-based hazer, which will end up on everything. Um, but uh, it's a little more expensive, but uh, a little bit of haze in there lets you get a lot of things. Um, I will say that if you make it too thick inside of a theater, it'll set off the alarms, just in case you wondered. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go ahead, Chris. I have a hazer in my room so that my lights look better. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I have a hazer in the garage. I, I, will, say, I will say this, that um, looking over my shoulder, I mean, the blue looks okay. Uh, I think it looks nice here. Look my My trick is separating it. Like, I want the background and yeah. my light to be totally different. So I've, I have my key and my fill flagged in such a way that it doesn't affect the background and it allows me to get the balance better. Yeah, absolutely. Next question. Morgan Price, Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. I now have three Macs with 10G Ethernet. I'm looking to connect them and wondering what's the simplest 10G switch worth buying for a home office. Go ahead, Jeffrey. TrendNet has a uh, a simple uh, four port 10G switch, which works uh, which should work really well for you. They also have uh, combo switches, so two of the ports will be 10G, two of them will be 2.5G. Uh, but it's also dependent on what you're going to be using it for. Do you need uh, power over Ethernet with these switches? Do you just need them to talk between the three Macs, or do you need to have it talk within the rest of the network? And that's that's where you're going to really put some thought into uh, what you're going to use for a switch. Now, of course, once again, about three hundred fifty dollars is what it's going to cost for that type of switch. That's not technically well, yeah, technically an enterprise switch. Yeah, depending. We use most of the ones that we have are TP Link or Cisco, but they, you know, they, you know, they're all in about the same price range that Jeffrey's talking about. Next question. Mike Edwards, Brooklyn, New York, asking, Morning, guys. I'm looking to make uh, some 6G SDI cables, especially for longer runs. I'm already sold on the Neutrik connectors, but what cables, brand, and models should I be looking at? Thanks. 
Yeah, so the um, the cables that we use um, are the Clark Wire and Cable. So we buy them from Clark Wire and Cable, and they are the, I asked Kevin, I was like, what are the ones that we use? We use the CD7559. So it's a CD7559. That's the 12G version. Um, but, you know, you can, I, we might as well, you might as well buy those ones. Those are, um, they're, they're a smaller gauge, and we use them that way because it's easier, to, when you build the kits, they're, they're easier to deal with. If you use the larger gauge ones, you'll you'll have trouble. Now, it depends on how far you want to run them. I don't. I think we've actually run these cables up to 200 feet, but I wouldn't recommend it. I would recommend um, starting to go to a larger gauge at about 75 feet. Um, but we found that we're, they're relatively, especially at 6G, which isn't that hard. Um, they're they're relatively uh, robust up until about 75 feet, and then after that, you need to think about it. We don't think about that that much because once we get to 75 feet, we start thinking about fiber. Um, we don't like running. Uh, video over copper that far. Um, next question. Chris Fenwick, Emeryville, California, and right here on our panel asking, ah, uh, Zoom ISO, you are a fickle mistress. In the saga of screen sharing, I think I have a trick to get it to work more reliable. May I share? Go ahead, Chris. Yeah. Um, so my problem is, is that sometimes you turn the screen share on and it uh, it just doesn't show. The other day I was saying that screen share works, active screen share sometimes works um but just the other day i want to i think i can show you this here down here if you set your screen share and then you come over here and you go tink disable and then click over on the enable uh, right at the bottom of the the screen there um it works it, all the time i've had it be very successful like half a dozen eight times it just like pops right back in. I was like, oh, good, I can move forward. So all the time, a superlative like that, I don't know if I'm comfortable saying that. <laughs> right. But every time I've wanted it to work, yes, it seemed to work. So just disable, re-enable, and it, everything pops up. So. That's great. Uh, next question. Yeah. Andre Dole in Berlin. Oliver, can I listen to an audio submix of sources that aren't live? For example, bringing Zoom audio output into Mimo, send it to a separate mix into my headphones, combined with my live microphone, which also goes into Zoom. Go to Oliver. Uh, Andy asked some uh, tough questions today. Um, yeah, so uh, yes, that's possible. Um, uh, there is a little snack in this thing that means that you have to have the audio in the layer stack if you want to listen to it. Uh, but you can create uh, separate audio mixes and you might want to create an audio mix uh, for the program out as well so that you don't have um, uh, some sources in there. So um, uh, it's it's getting a little, it's, it's, it can be done, but it's getting a little bit difficult or uh, complicated. So um, uh, yeah, if more more details maybe you might want to reach out in the forum and we can dis discuss it there in the, the boings forums uh, next question tobias moss in minneapolis for a live band accruing fans for local shows do you agree that an email list is king what are the next couple of priorities to increase attendance and ticket sales go ahead, jeffrey uh facebook simple as that uh if you, you, you they you just put up some qr codes and uh, people will have the ability to uh, scan them and get onto Facebook like the Facebook. Uh, there's so many different ways that you can connect with your audience uh, using that. And then of course, if you attach your Instagram to your Facebook page, then they're getting the pictures, they're getting the information, uh, and if you keep updating it, then they're gonna stay on your lists and, and you, can, you can send out lists uh, in geographic locations through Facebook. And so I, I actually, I would say that over email right now. Go ahead, John. I used to own an internet marketing company. One of my customers is a local singer-songwriter here in Vegas. He did two things. He used a QR code that took people to the lead capture page for email and their address and everything. But he also used texting. And open rates on email is, is about 15% right now. But texting is about 80%. And so if you use a short code, text your email address to 6902 it's 90 accuracy on text messaging every place he plays he's got a list of about fifteen thousand people on his list and sales increase in the bar wherever he goes he's been he's been a singer songwriter for 30 years is very successful good bill 
Yeah, I think what what you're hearing here is that different communities are naturally connected to different social media systems. Uh, you know, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Discord, they all have their place. They all have their audiences. Where do your band's potential fans hang out? I agree that if you want something persistent, things like email and texting is probably how you're going to reach out to them afterwards. But to find them, to gather that community and make them true fans, I think you need to go where they are, wherever that is. And it's changed over time as each generation comes up. You know, one of the things I spent a bunch of time on last night, and, and I think because it, it's, it, you definitely email is important and all those other things, but creating a kind of magical experience when someone sees you live, even if it's like with 10 people, um, makes the biggest difference. You know, so figuring out how you get them involved. I, I saw a band, uh, a band called Live uh, with 50 people <laughs> you know, a long time ago. And, uh, and they knew how to pull the audience in when they were 50. And then when there was a hundred and then there was three fifty, then it was a stadium, you know, and, and it went, and it was, and they, but what they did is they, the thing that makes a difference is, um, well, one of the things that makes a difference is, uh, in audience inclusion in your live events. You know, you're, a lot of people just get into a point where they're just playing. I just watched last night. I watched Bobby McFerrin play an audience. Like I was just like, my, my, my daughter knew where this was and she's like, oh, you got to check this out. We were talking about something and she goes, oh, check this out. And he's literally dancing on the stage and the audience is playing the notes as he dances. And then he starts to sing accompaniment while he's dancing. It was kind of the craziest thing I had ever seen. And there's a, there's another one that was related to him. If you go to search him, you'll see another, this other guy who does that all the time. He's like pointing, he, he trains the audience and I'm surprised at how much in tune the audience sounds, you know, on average, there's probably some bad notes there, but on average, they're all kind of following along. I guarantee that uh, the people walk out feeling like they went to something that they that, that was magical that they couldn't get at home that they couldn't just listen to, and you know there's there's some bands that are you know obviously Foo Fighters does a pretty good job of doing that. Um, Billy Bragg is a master at it. Like he knows that when he plays, you you know that when he plays uh, a New England, um, you know that the audience is going to sing half of it. Like, you know, like he's, he knows that everybody in the audience will know that song and he'll, and he plays with them and he keeps cueing them to, to play. But so he takes those, the songs that he knows, there's a hand, there's like two or three songs like that, that he knows that everyone's going to know if they know Billy Bragg and he gets them to sing it. You go on YouTube and search Billy Bragg, you know, uh, you know, live or whatever, you'll see him singing with the audience. And I think that that's an audience that will sign up on the way out <laughs> and want to know and want to know when the next one is. Um, the other thing to pay attention to is is making sure that you're registered with bands bands in town. So there's a couple of these kind of bands in town things. I get those no notices and I look at them every single day. I'm like who's 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 coming through? Um, uh, so it's definitely worth thinking about. Uh, go ahead, Mitchell. Yeah, if you want my undying loyalty, swag goes swag. a long way. Okay, All right, Bill. To Alex's point, uh, the first person I who was on my radio does this brilliantly is Jacob Collier. He's a musician and a composer and a multi-instrumentalist. And he is so good that he actually went around and started doing this, not just with a general audience, but with symphonies and with music schools. And he'd go to Berkeley and he'd have the entire Berkeley class as his instrument and would play them in a thing. It's an, a phenomenon. So yeah. look at some of the Jacob I Collier stuff on YouTube. It's Jacob Collier that I was trying to think. Jacob Collier is who I was trying to think of when I was thinking about the Bobby McFerrin. I just couldn't come up with his name because I'd never heard of him until last night when my daughter was showing me how this all happens. Uh, go He's ahead. Extraordinary. Uh, go ahead, Chris. The Bobby McFerrin thing is great. Uh, there's a friend of ours. Uh, his band is uh, called Eight Track Massacre, which is a great name. Um, and he does Take On Me and that high E, which basically nobody can sing in right. that song. He always just gives it up to the audience and the audience feels like they're, you know, taking part in it and nobody in the room can sing that note. I don't know how the guy ever sang that, but yes, audience participation is key. Yeah. The, um, I, in another life I, I did, I promoted bands for Sony music. And, um, you know, one of the things that to get back to what Mitchell, Mitchell reminded me of the fact that I used to, uh, give away things for your email or it wasn't email it was your snail mail address when i did it there was no email like so 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 there was and what we did is i like i went allison change was opening for like iggy pop or something like that and um and this is back when allison change was still i was driving them around in my little honda for interviews and i had i ordered from the factory like a thousand cassettes and i just had a cassette you could have a free cassette if you fill out this little form i, I cut these little pieces of paper out and you know i would acquire like 800 
you know, mail, mailing addresses. The key with that mailing, I built up about a couple thousand people, um, 3,000 people in that mailing list. And it was in, at the time, it was probably the most pow powerful mail mailing list for music in, 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 um, in the Pittsburgh area, you know, that big, big thing. But here's why is that I never touched you without giving you something great. So people would come in and say, hey, I wanna, I I'd like to email your mailing list. Cause I mean, I, it was like a leverage. I had this leverage. I could fill any record store with 200 people like that. You know, you give me one week, I'll have 300 people, 200 people like fill in your record store or I'd fill, you know, I could fill any venue under about 700 people, um, you know, with people. But the reason that that worked was because people would come and say, hey, can I mail your mailing list? I was like, what are you gonna give away? Oh, I'm not going to give anything away. I just want them to know. I was like, no, nah, I'm not interested. And, and they said, well, I'll give them 15% off. I'm like, ah, I'm not interested in 15% off. You, we're starting 30, 35%. We, make it, we can start talking half off you're in. And so I'd get people to give half off on things that mattered. And I looked at everyone through the lens of, I want to know, I want to look at that and go, I want to, open, I want to grab onto that postcard because that postcard has got something valuable for me. And that's what made that list so powerful is that I would never use it if I wasn't, and I might announce something else, tell you, oh, by the way, there's a, there's a, there's a, you know, <laughs> you know, by the way, Toad What's Brocket is playing at graffiti or whatever, you know, like down, down at the bottom, but something was in it that was going to be of real value to that list. And, um, and it was super, you know, I don't know what, the, you know, we can't calculate open rates, but wow, did a lot of people show up <laughs> to things um, because they definitely read them and they definitely knew it was there. So think about not only your mailing list, but are people going to want to sort that into a folder or put it in priority? And you want to think about how you how you do that. Um, next question. From John Foltz in Sealings Grove, Pennsylvania. John asks, can someone please remind me of the domain registrar preferred by the panel? Thanks. Uh, real quick. Uh, go ahead, Mitchell. Um, Just the oldest, name is all you need. <laughs> yeah, uh, the oldest, uh, one of the best uh, network solutions. Oof. Uh, yeah, go ahead, uh, John. You know, I, I use them all, and right now, probably Hover is the one I'm using the most. Good. Oliver? So I think um, uh, it, it's important to separate the registrar from the DNS provider. And um, I'm using, uh, for DNS provider, I'm using Cloudflare uh, uh, an awful lot in, last, in the last uh, couple of years uh, because that's uh, just very convenient and they have a very, very, very uh, fast and uh, secure uh, DNS provider. So... That might be something to consider. Yeah, we use DNS. We use a mixture of Hover and and, and uh, Cloudflare. And for registration, uh, we I will I moved everything to Hover. <laughs> like it takes a lot of trouble to get into Hover, but to me, Hover is like a hundred times better than everything else that I've used, and I've used most of them. And it took me a long time to get them to all move to the right place. Next question. Next one in from Matthias Otilia from Helsinki, Finland. What does one do with more than one super source? Use it with another ME or can you use two super sources in the same ME? Uh, you can use two super sources. And so you don't use them in the same ME. You set them up in one ME. So you'll set one super source up in one ME and then another super source. You put it in as another one, as, a, as an input for another super source. And then you have a lot more. And I think that that's how we're, I believe that's how we're doing it here. Uh, for this show, when we do it, the guys the guys do that a lot on their own, but but the um, that's how we've used it in the past, um, and so and it also allows you to work on one super source while the other one is live. So, um, you know, we have a, a luxury here for this show where we're active automatically inputting all the inputs into a into a super source, which is very rare. Like when I say that that's the case, you see a lot of people in video production go, what? <laughs> you, know, like you can just automatically put the people in that are talking because um, usually you don't know who they are. You know, they're on a regular camera. It doesn't say who that person is. And so that oftentimes that that has that super source has to be manually turned on, you know, not, you know, instead of automatic. And so uh, you have to have one super source open while and someone's populating it. Um, and there's obviously some macros, like we always know we want this close up with this wide or we did, 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 did. and so you can have those things. Um, and so, but you do get a lot more creative. Again, if you're using black magic hardware, you get a lot more creative when you have MixEffect Pro um, use, you know, in it because you can, you have so much more fluidity and you'll feel less of the need to use more than one super source because of that. Um, but uh, anyway, I would, uh, I, uh, I, you know, having two is amazing. Um, having one is often enough if you've got the right tools. Uh, next question. 
From Zach Phillips in Philadelphia and here in our panel, what is the panel using for remote desktop and managing lots of machines with different operating systems? I'm particularly interested in how you make configuration changes across multiple Macs and PCs at once. Go ahead, Jeffrey. Uh, so for remote uh, remote desktop is what I use when I'm going from Mac to Mac or Mac to PC. But if I'm going from PC to Mac, then I'll use real VNC. Uh, and, it, and of course, it, I'm not in a high secure area, so uh, real VNC is is not at probably the highest security that it should be. Uh, but those are the ways that I do it. And the best part is uh, when you're doing remote control from a Mac, you can do it from an iPad using uh, either the Mac uh, uh, server uh, connection or through a remote desktop, which is the Microsoft option. Next question. Mike Edwards in Brooklyn, New York, asking, Morning, guys. Oliver. What new uh, updates can you share planned for Memo Live in 2023? Love See, Oliver software. shows up. Everyone's like, Oliver's on the show. Let's yeah. ask him all the questions. And so do you have any any, any updates for us, Oliver? Um, <clears throat> yeah, so uh, we never know what's going to happen um, down the road. So we there's there's actually not that much. Um, there, there's not a, a, a plan for 2023 uh, with all the stuff. But I can uh, share with you something we're working on right now. I, I sent a preview to Alex already. Um, we have developed a source that um, allows you to input key and fill uh, into Mimo Live, so you can use an ultimate um, key, uh, hardware key for uh, keying um, your video. And the um, Gorilla thing with this thing is that you can output it over NDI and so use ultimate um, um, hardware keying uh, over NDI in NDI workflows if you want to. Uh, the other thing. Um, uh, we might be able to share in about uh, maybe three, four weeks um, is actually uh, Zoom. Um, we are working on the Zoom SDK uh, integration. So you can just have uh, a Zoom source and uh, just get uh, ISO um, feeds from Zoom into MimoLive without uh, the need for Zoom ISO or any other tool in between. And will that be a subscription? Uh, or it's, a use by uh, it's, usage it's, or... And it's gonna be it's gonna be in in the Mimo Life subscription. So if you have a Mimo Life uh, oh, Studio right. subscription, um, uh, it's, part of it. it's this this will just be part of it. Yes, oh, that's fantastic. That's really that's really cool. Um, next question from Bob Sturdivant in San Antonio, Texas. Bob asked, "I recently had ChatGPT look at some Python code and asked it to input remarks and see if it could make the code more efficient. It did a fair job. Has anyone else tried it? And how were your results?" I go to Oliver. Yeah, so uh, actually, we tried using it, uh, figuring out the Blackmagic SDK stuff, and uh, it it uh, it sort of worked, but it made some uh, very grave mistakes. Uh, so we 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 made we we did a lot of experiments with it, and uh, if you know what it's supposed to output, so if you're an expert in programming, it can save you a lot of time because it. You know, writes all the 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 the, the um, boilerplate code, um, but you need to be able to spot where it's going wrong, and then you can actually say, you know, you can actually tell it and say, you know, there's a mistake in this code, please fix it, and then it will try to do that. And uh, if you iterate through that enough, um, sometimes uh, it it comes up with uh, quite well working code. So that's really amazing, and I think. Um, you know, down the road, um, if you can, if if you can, if we can feed it uh, like the Mimo Life code and and uh, as a context, and then ask it to implement stuff uh, specifically for Mimo Life, I think it will be doing a good job at um, you know doing at least a a first draft. Uh, but but you still have to be an expert to see if what what it produces um, is actually making sense. Go ahead, John. I agree with Oliver. The the uh, the OpenAI product is called Codex, and it was trained it was trained on GitHub, which is owned by Microsoft. And there's some arguments going back and forth about the copyrights on that. Uh, but if you use it in if you use it in uh, VS Code, you just type what you want it to do in the comments. It's pretty good. Sixty, I would say sixty, but exactly what Oliver said. 
60 percent to 80 percent accuracy but it's only going to get better from here yeah exactly um yeah go ahead mitchell yeah, speaking for the neo luddites in the audience, um, uh, when computers start uh, programming themselves, we're in a lot of trouble. <laughs> uh, next question from Peter Belbin in Houston, Texas. Alex, you mentioned that you're using Mimo Live more of late. What are the features it has that make it attractive versus a hardware switcher? Are you starting to ease up regarding reluctance to use software-based switchers? You know. I'm testing a lot of different ways to do use Zoom ISO. I mean, that's that's really the the thing that I'm mostly focused on right now is is how do we uh, make that work? And I think that Mimo is the best solution on the Mac to um, you know incorporate all of those things. And so, um, you know, I've tested a bunch of different things, and I find that Mimo is the, the kind of the best one for me to use in that area. It's also if I just want to use a, I have a Mac Studio, and like for instance, after the show. I'll put my little Mac Studio into a little case, <laughs> a little little carrying case, and I will take it down, and I'll hook up a couple of webcams uh, to do the Michael Krasny show. And I just find that having it all in one computer, and there's not a lot of wires, they're just web, especially when I'm using webcams. Because and what also changed it for me, to be honest, is the link, the th the Insta360 link was finally a camera that I felt like I could use in in like a little production. And so so I felt like that that changed what I could do. I'm hoping that Oliver will add uh, controls to the link. Uh, other people are doing that with some of their SDK or I don't know, maybe it's just UBC, but, but it, the link is, is, has changed the way I look at cutting on a computer because it, it actually is a pretty high, the, um, the, yeah, Insta 360 link is, is what's kind of changed a lot of things for me about the viability of using web cameras in a production. Um, so, so that's, that's part of it. I'm also building a system around an extreme SDI. I'm building a system, you know, we, we obviously use different systems in the office. So I'm using all the different ways that I, you know, that want, that I could possibly incorporate it. But the the pipeline that I'm building, especially on Saturdays, you'll see me, I mean, I'll be experimenting with it, is I have Memo Live and then I use Soundesk. Um, and so then I have, I take loop back and pass all the Zoom ISO out to Soundesk. I take the videos and I use Siphon to send it off to Memo. I then take the sound desk output and put it back into Memo. And now I have a full mixer, um, a, a full online mixer with um, EQ and effects and everything else um, that's passing uh, content back into into Memo. Um, and then I make you know, and I'm able to cut a you know cut a fairly full show. I do want to. I'm going to try to drag Oliver into a lab that we that, that I want to do soon because there's definitely some holes in my understanding of what I can and can't. I, fortunately, I can email. I, uh, like, how can you not do that? And, and it was I couldn't find Siphon because it's below the below the fold. I opened. I kept on hitting the thing, and I just see all the inputs. And I thought those were all the inputs. And I was like, it's not. How can Siphon not be here? It's just further down. It's a little embarrassing. Go ahead, Chris. Uh, Alex, you mentioned that you're using the InstaLink 360, the little webcam thing. Insta 360 um, link, yeah. It, right, right, right. So in the user interface that runs that, it, yeah. I only have one of them. I'm not, yeah. I don't have 17 of them or, like you do or whatever. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner of the UI, it appears as though there's like an, on mine, there's like a little number one. It looks yep. like I can click on that. Oh, yeah. Does that allow you to toggle between multiple of them? Yes, it does. And so, so yeah, so you can, yeah, that's, that's what made it like, as soon as I bought two of them, I bought two more. So I have four of them. Um, and so, and you can, to put it, make it more, more interesting, you can take four of those and put them straight into zoom as if you have a zoom room and now you have four cameras feeding back to, you know, so if I wanted to do like a cooking show, I wouldn't need to do any, if I want to just send all those back to, um, the remote head to be edited together. I don't have to have any editing on that on a remote on a remote guest. I could have two, three, four of those cameras sending back over a Zoom room. Still only one audio, but you'd still be able to send all four cameras back. You could so one of the models that I'm testing is, oh, I could take a turn a M2 Mac Mini for five ninety nine into a Zoom room, and then I send you out with, you know, send it out with three cameras. For, let's say for a cooking show. That person just sets those up uh, however we need them. And then we have UBC control and we move them around and, and we can get, get the show that we want. It's, it's pretty cool. Here's an idea you may be interested in. Uh, just the other day, um, our friends Tucker and Jonas were doing a broadcast from Barcelona. They took four um, feeds. They, they quad-splitted them into a 4K stream they sent it up to the cloud or wherever you want to send it. And then they selectively screen scraped the separate quadrants. Mm -hmm. 
and boom, now they have the four, their four feeds all off of one 4K up, uplink stream. Yeah, we do that uh, a lot in back broadcast. To home. In broadcast, we do great. that a lot. Yeah, yeah, it's it, it, we do it. We don't do it with screen scrapes, but because broadcast a lot of times treats 4K like a quad, you know, so it's got a quad out. So if you take a 4K stream and you send it to an FS, you know, or, or send it to to a the hardware device, you can have it go in as 12G and come out as a, as a quad, and it just grabs onto the quads for you, you know. So if you for the videos, and so mm-hmm. there's a, if you have a you know 12G to to quad converter, which Blackmagic makes, you can just simply take a 12G output out out of some you know out of your whatever it is. And just plumb it into it. Now you can do it in the cloud as well. You can do screen scrapes, but but in hardware, uh, transporting four four feeds together to make sure that they stay in sync um, in four in quads is is a pretty common common practice. Yeah. Tucker did a really cool little reveal where at one point they cuts to the close up of Jonas in Barcelona, and he starts explaining the quad thing. And Tucker had pre programmed a a little DVE pull and he pulled out while Jonas is talking and you could see the four feeds and like yeah. globally minds were going, oh, interesting yeah, it's, idea. It's a great way to keep all the cameras in sync, you know, um, is, to, is to send them that way. Uh, yeah, go ahead, uh, Oliver. Did you? Yeah, I um, I I just uh, screwed up the audio. Um, so yeah, uh, you you don't need to do a screen scrape if you use Mimo Live to use to send to separate the. It'll grab them automatically. Yeah, that's great. It's fantastic. Um, yeah, and so that's one of the many reasons we use it. Uh, next question. James Babbitt in San Diego, California, asking on MacBreak, uh, Alex discussed having a presentation about MidJourney on the Ask the Tech Guys show. What time will the presentation be on Sunday? I don't know when the presentation is going to be. Uh, it's the um, I don't. It's the the show is I think from eleven a.m. to two p.m. So somewhere in there, I'm going to guess that it's after one p.m. <laughs> so uh, only because my deadline um, for sending it in is one p.m. on Sunday, which I'm not going to get ahead of. I'm going to do it today or tomorrow. <laughs> uh, but but uh, I I recorded a perfect one for last week, and then I didn't have the right audio input setup. It's embarrassing. So anyway, uh, so that'll that'll be uh, next. Uh, but that that'll be coming up. Yeah, go ahead, Harshi. Yeah, I was just going to state that the times are 2 to 5 Eastern, 11 to uh, whatever the time might turn out to be. So, Next question. Tony Mobley in Newton, Georgia, asking, what is the best way to bring in a guest from a Zoom meeting into Mimo Live to provide them with graphics and a lower third? Sounds like it's coming up soon. Go ahead, Oliver. Right now, I think uh, the the Zoom ISO is the best way to go. uh, to get a feed from Zoom into Mimo Live, uh, but you know, a couple of weeks. Let's see what happens. <laughs> Very good. Uh, next question from Zach Phillips in Philadelphia. What's the best way on a Mac to turn NDI into webcam? NDI tools squashes anything to 720p 30, but broadcast software virtual cameras seem heavy on the processor. Yeah, go ahead, Oliver. Yeah, of course, the uh, the uh, apps like Mimo Life or OBS or Ecamm are the way to go here because um, the stuff that uh, NewTek or NDI makes um, is is not uh, very well working on on the Mac. Um, it, you can you can take an NDI feed and and put it into a webcam, but uh, as you said, uh, it's uh, just uh, a fixed 720p. Uh, resolution and if you want different ones you, you have to go with a virtual camera um, vendor like the other ones that are available next question tony mobley new new georgia asking can oliver talk the benefit of memo live forum go ahead uh oliver now uh, this is turning into a show where i have to say hello well, you know you don't <laughs> you don't show up for a while and and we uh you know that's the that's what happens. so I, I i i accrue all the minutes and now i am i can spend them now exactly well, uh I, I would love to see everyone in the forum uh forum.boings.com is the is the address um uh, the benefit of that is, of course, that uh, we, we we are there to answer all the questions and uh, a lot of other um, very knowledgeable uh, Mimo Life users are there. And 
uh, of course, I want to have all the people in my forum. Um, I, I always I also try to answer the questions in the Discord channel for um, for office hours. Um, and anywhere else I can, you know, I get uh, questions and I, I find them. And uh, I, but uh, the best way to get a certain answer uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, is, is to go to the forums. Next question. Jack Rappel in Breckenridge, Colorado, asking, yesterday you discussed GoPro Cameras Labs firmware, uh, which allows any settings to be changed with a QR code without fiddling on the phone or camera. Any experience? I have not seen that. I'm super interested in that. <laughs> I don't remember us talking about that, but but it's great. Maybe I missed that that part of the, the puzzle. Uh, but that that sounds like a that would be amazing. So if that's actually the case that you can finally get a GoPro there and just point it at something and have it do the thing, um, it makes me actually want to get a new new GoPro uh, because that's the number one thing that's problematic. Number one, number two being heat heat management. <laughs> that's the number two problem with a GoPro. Uh, but if you can handle those two things, it works pretty well. Next question. Chris Fenwick in Emeryville, California. Alex, you mentioned SoundDesk a few times. What is the latency of it as a mixer? I'd never heard of it till now. Negligible. I mean, I, I would say negligible. I mean, I'm delaying it because I, I need to delay it for the video as it goes in so that it's faster than the video that's coming in. <laughs> so so it's a, it's a uh, you know, here's the worst part. It's an app that's been sitting on my, com I realized I requested it from them three years ago or two years ago. Um, and they make another thing called Sonic Atom, which I've used for a couple of years, which is the, um, it's a, it's a, a scopes for audio. And I was looking at some of the other stuff they have. They have this thing called Fluctus, which is um, does uh, loops, lets you edit loops. And um, and uh, and then uh, anyway, so then they had the sound desk and I was like, oh, I don't need that. And then there was a point where I needed it. And so I, I asked them for it and then it just sat there. I was busy. And I started, when I was starting to work with Memo, I was like, oh, I'd be really good if I had a software mixer. And so I was looking at a couple different things. I didn't really want a DAW that does it. I wanted a, like a mixer mixer. <laughs> I want a mixer that does the mixing thing. And the only one that I could find that is truly a mixer that does what it does is SoundDesk. And um, it's not that expensive. And so, uh, so anyway, so I'm testing it right now. So far, it's been, it's been really good. You get used, you kind of got to get used to how it works and everything else, like everything else. But it's pretty simple. I mean, I just do a loop, I do loop back and grab, you know, eight outputs or 12 outputs or whatever. And it doesn't seem to have any real limit to it. And then each one of those, it has the stacks of effects that you could add to it. Now, I'm sure that if I add enough enough effects to things, it would be problematic, but it still takes, you know, your standard VST or VST AU. You know, AU, like it takes all those those things and yeah. puts them in there. Now the question is, can it process those live? And I don't, I don't know if it can or not. Um, so, have, those, have you been putting a lot of plugins or any plugins on anything yet? I, the only thing I've been doing with it so far is EQ. So just just okay. EQing and and delay. So those things work. <laughs> so so those are, um, but I haven't I haven't pushed it any harder than than. That have so you explored the idea of having some sort of a, a, a hardware interface to to drive it? Have you found anything that uh, you like? That's my next step. You know, so I'm definitely okay. looking at using like a MIDI board, like an Elation. There's a bunch of different ones that I'm looking at that I'm trying to figure out that um, that I may be adding to that. Um, cool. So yeah, so Thank I'm you. still still early on, but I, it looks like, I think it should take uh, OSC and, I think OSC and MIDI. So there's a bunch of opportunities there to do something all. And again, I'm, it's just a test case. You know, I, do, I, I like hardware, but I am trying to test this idea that I can have a Mac Studio that just does a whole show. And I'm not quite there yet, but I'm getting there. Uh, next question. Alexander Knight in Vancouver, British Columbia, Canada. What's the best way to avoid video feedback in Zoom? There's a screenshot to it there. Good, Bill. Feedback, audio, or video always happens when any input is patched to see its own output and you create this endless loop. So you've got to break that chain. It could be complex if there's all sorts of switching going on back there. But one way or another, that's what causes it. So break that chain and it goes away. Next question. Next one from Douglas Carmichael. Mac Stadium and other cloud providers have talked up Mac minis in the cloud that are instantly available. How would they be working around the long delivery times for the M1 and 2 series? Go to Oliver. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm using a uh, Mac, um, a Mac Mini. I, I just ordered a Mac Mini M2, and it got delivered today. And I ordered it like three days ago, so there is not a, a very long 
you know, waiting list and it's an M M2 Pro and you can go into the store and pick one up. So I think uh, that's not an issue for the cloud people. It's like more like getting, um, you know, the quality, um, uh, you know, the, the, the tools working and, and making sure that they um, they work. So that's, I think we'll see that very, very fast. Last question for the first hour. And Douglas Carmichael's back. Uh, do you think that social media professionals should still include TikTok in their media mix despite the growing pressures against it in the U.S.? Real quick, Mitchell. Yeah, we were talking about it last night. Uh, we think we have a U.S. alternative called Tic Tac, the Minty alternative. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's Minty. Uh, yeah, it, uh, it, um, yeah, yeah you, you don't, as a social media person, you don't give up social media platforms until someone forces you to. Like, you know, so that's, if, if, you're, if you've got a lot of followers, you're going to keep using it. Uh, they probably should be getting good at using shorts as well on, on YouTube. That's probably the other output there. All right, now we're jumping into our second hour. And for the panelists, uh, go ahead and raise your hand if you want to, if you have things to say. I'm going to show about five minutes of of uh, stills uh, so that people can just th kind of get people's juices rolling and have them think about a couple things. Um, and then we'll jump to the panelists who have raised their hand and then we'll jump to the questions. And so, um, but we want to try to get to the questions by about 8.15. So we'll move uh, fairly quickly here. Let me um, just pop this up. And um, so uh, let me cut to this. Um, so here's um, one of our first little fly kits um, that are there. So a lot of times what you're thinking about, um, I'm just going to try to use each photo as to talk about something specific, regardless of what's all in the photo. Um, one thing is, is that when we started early on, uh, we started you know, getting getting kits that had pre-built uh, um, uh, you know, screw ins that are there. We moved to this one has those where you can, you, they actually are threaded into that in an area. It's nice if you're only going to build it once. If you rotate a lot of them, you're going to want to get the old server ones that actually have inserts because eventually someone puts the wrong screws in, um, they, you know, or they do something else and they strip it and then you have to replace it. Um, so that's something to think about there. Um, you know, fly kits are not just racks. So it's figuring out how you set those up. So these are monitor systems that we've had on site um, and these are big rigs and we use six ups at a very often. You'll see a, a couple of pictures of this, but we use six ups all the time um, with these with these monitors, um, so that we have all the monitoring we need. Um, this takes about I think this one takes about a um, half a day to set up. Um, here you can see you know some of the racks here. Um, this is the shading, and it's just pulling right out of the rack. Um, obviously, you have a, a, a. Oftentimes, these are very modal, so we build them like this is the record rack. Um, here's the shader rack. Um, here's the editing rack, and these are all pulled out so that they can be kind of tied together and and made. Um, you know, they can be pulled together relatively quickly, but you have them in in sections as you need them. Um, same thing here. You can see when they say producer rack or or that that kind of thing, they are oftentimes built at a certain. Um, a certain width so that they slide right into these, and and you can move them out there, and that that's pretty effective. The other thing we like to do is use uh, as much as we can when we're building these fly packs, if we're going into remote areas, is we love to make desks out of them. So we have, in this case, we built this one so that it had hooks on both sides. And so this would automatically just set down between them and form the desk that we needed for, for that process. And you have to think about space. Um, so this is a very small room. That's why it's shot with a fisheye. Um, one thing that you have to think about also a lot, and you'll see, I'll talk about it a couple of times, is heat. Um, there was a switcher here. Um, this was a little, it was brand new. It just caught, uh, it was a one ME, a little production switcher and it caught fire. <laughs> it putting it at the top without any fans. Uh, it didn't, it didn't flame, but there was a lot of smoke. Um, here you can see this is multiple fly kits. And so this was five different shows going on all at the same time. Um, so it's a, it's a five sessions at the same time happening in one studio. Um, so we've had 25 people in there and each one of them had their own space that they were actually working on. So this is kind of a digital first event, but only six or seven years ago. <laughs> so, um, uh, but that's, you know, so each, each person has their own producers and so on and so forth. And we built one rack, figured it out and then built the rest of them. Now here's a larger kit. Um, this is for Dreamforce. And so you can see, and we're just one section. This is, we're, there's probably six sections like this. We were just managing the webcast. Um, but you can see the, you can see the stuff here. These boxes back here are typically crikey boxes. So they have the things that might happen as opposed to the things that we need. The, the rest of the cases go somewhere else, but most of the cases, um, you know, come out. Um, usually we bring even our own tables and chairs um, because the ones that the venue stink. Um, this is that kit, except all the rooms are in one room. Um, and so before, when we build these fly kits, 
um, to go out to multiple session rooms, uh, we test them all, like literally test everything through everything um, all at one time to make sure that we're not figuring this out on site. Um, the, the big advantage of owning gear is not having to build, not have to figure out what's working and not working. When we show up, everything works, everything's been tested, everything's been put together, and we're only having to deal with integrating with third parties. Um, again, another, you can see this is a nice little rack. This is, so here, Brian was able to manage all six rooms that he was managing from here. He had, that's a, those laptop, every laptop is talking to uh, an Midas 32 or whatever, and we're able to move the sliders. And then we just tell the the guys that came with the venue to stop moving the sliders. <laughs> so like they're there, they're there because we have to put them there, but they should stop, stop doing that. Um, anyway, and then you can see a lot of comms that, that go into it. In this case, we we're using a lot of clear comm to, to make all of that work. It, comms are a big deal. Anyway, um, again, kind of a more close up of that of that system or a different system. We've done this a couple times here. So, um, and this is our main main throw through rack um, that just kind of everything went in and out of that and routed and was converted as needed. In this case, the rack becomes important if we go to a wider shot. Um, this is we had an hour and a half to load in. So that's the other problem with fly packs is that you have to, you know, think about them um, here. And so you can see like all of this stuff got kind of put together. This is our audio rack over here. Um, but all of those things had to be put together very quickly. Um, another set of racks here, again, heat dissipation, uh, putting a bunch of hyperdecks together was not, not one of our smartest moves. Um, anyway, and um, but thinking about that, I'd, I'd love to say I have better cable management. But we'll, again, when we have two hours to set up, we weren't as good at it. Um, another one here. Um, and this is just thinking about these, you know, these racks here. But we really think through all of those, you know, pieces as we as we go through it. Another one of the Dreamforce one. This is another year. Each year is different. Um, sometimes the racks come a lot smaller. Um, so you got to look at what you need to do and what needs to be produced to to make that work. Um, one of the things we do a lot is build modular racks. You know, so these are little little SKB sections, and some of them are open and some of them are closed. We kind of move more to the open ones because they do better heat dissipation. But each one of them has their own little mission, and you just stack them on top of each other. Um, and to, you know, to put them all, put them all together. You can see a whole bunch of them here. <laughs> They're all stacked up, each doing their, their own thing within that space. Um, this is another version of the White House where we had this here, um, more refined um, setup and a lot more designed than the, than the first uh, iteration in the East Room. Um, a lot of times you have to think about where you're going to put everything. So this, the, when we build these fly kits, we're trying to minimize cable runs um, to make sure all of that works. So we we kind of think about where our tables are going to be and in our rider, we'll tell people where, what, how much space we need. And we take into account the amount of space we need on the other side of the rack. And so we, you know, so we usually ask for three feet on the other side of the rack, as well as the three feet for the chairs um, as we, as we grid that out. And, you know, we hold everybody to it and we get them to sign off on this. This is the space we're going to get. And we, we don't give up a foot. Um, this is a, a rack that manages multiple sessions here. We needed to obviously, um, you know, do a lot of conversion. Um, these are primary and backup conversions, uh, along with records, along with all the conversion here. This is mostly this whole rack just provides these scopes. <laughs> you know, so that's, that's all it does is provide scopes for us. Um, and what that means is with each one of these, by having scopes all up there, I can look across the room and tell if the audio is right. Like I can literally look over there and go, oh, that one's too soft, this one's too over, and you can't manage a lot of rooms otherwise. The other thing I will say about about racks is that, um, uh, that making them look nice and tidy makes a difference. I mean, I guarantee I'd get a lot more work because we would like, literally I'd be upset if we got a scratch on any of these <laughs> you know, because, because it definitely makes you look different than everybody else that's, that's out there. Um, these are also um, filtering. These are, I think, Liebeck, um, you know, filtering uh, UPSs. They're useful. Um, more here, just thinking about, again, where all your screens are and what, what you're going to be putting together there. This is basically building a small broadcast truck, but not where you, when you don't have anywhere to park it. Um, and then the other thing we think a lot about is fans. So a lot of people don't do that when they first get started. So they they um they don't build things with a lot of fans, and then they then they do. Um, anyway, so that's that's something to kind of uh, start off the 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 discussion with. But I'm sure we ha we have some pretty uh, strong experts here. Go ahead, Jeff. Thanks, Alex. Well, for my world, and and we do a lot of flight packs uh, through the course of the year. Uh, many times, it's in a suitcase or something somewhere. So we're flying a little bit faster than the, the boxes can arrive. 
So our racks and things like that are sometimes smaller, like you're saying, like the modular size. But uh, if we're bringing in a full system, like replicating what I have, well, I'm in one of my trucks right now. In the production van, we have a full 22 space rack that's uh, top to bottom filled up. Uh, to fly that in and out, it's going to be fairly substantial. So we will go in with a lighter rack or a couple of different racks. Uh, when we're talking flight packs in that size, your air cargo and uh, timing and cost uh, get to be a pretty big thing. So for us uh, going down, like we'll be in uh, Mexico in a couple of weeks, uh, that's two or three rolling cases. So that's our idea of flight packs also. Uh, we don't necessarily call them flight racks, but flight packs. And then we have also flight packs that are racks. Yeah, I think we 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 started with with suitcases. Then we went to to a lot of Pelican cases. And then we went to case cases and started buying trucks and, and so on and so forth to move them around. Uh, I will admit that I, I love the fly packs, but there's a there's a ease. It is, it is more expensive. Uh, Jeff's 100 percent right. The, the ease of being able to load all of your gear into a handful of big racks as opposed to lots of little pieces that I got to put together um, definitely pays off over time. But it, it definitely requires a certain budget to make that work. Uh, go ahead, Mitchell. Nice stuff. Very impressive. What do you do when you have something very small? Let's say on the other side of the spectrum where you need to send a uh, system out to a uh, artist or a uh, political figure and uh, you need to manage it as we, a micro thing. We usually use um, uh, little four U's and three U's that we'll send out with a whole bunch of stuff packed into it. So we, ha we have one that we send out that's got a Mac mini and an ATEM and a USB a mix pre three and it's got all in a router and everything else is all kind of packed into it airtight almost and all they have to do is turn the switch on and everything lights up you know and they turn the switch on plug the internet in and we can start talking to them through it and then we go from there you know so it it, it is something that you have to think about but you know our fly i showed larger fly kits but our fly kits go down to like a for you that 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 might be um uh, or you know six you and we you know those are just things we check um but you do have to think about how you check them like one little thing that people miss is to put a a shelf underneath your large your large hardware so that when they get dropped they don't start bending the um their their connections go ahead jeffrey so i have been working on basically what i do is that uh, i go out and 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 work and i have to go out via plane let me start over so uh i usually fly when i when i go out so my fly kids are actually going to be a lot smaller than what alex has just seen but uh, and of course it's been a, it's evolving ever since my first one because we would uh we basically set up uh enterprise interviews and it, well it depends do we either have an enterprise interview or we have a talking head presentation and of course with the talking head presentation, there's a little bit less gear than it is a one-on-one -on -one interview because one-on-one uh, -on -one interview, you'll have three cameras as opposed to one camera and one screen. And so I'm, I'm just going to show you a quick few uh, items that I have in my fly kit, the current one that I'm going to be using this year. And it's going to start with this case right here. This is the SKB uh, in mold injection 2U case. It's a flight travel case. This is a case that you can put on in the overhead rather than have checked. Uh, and you can put a lot of different things in there, cables, computers, and a lot more. Of course, you got to watch out the weight. You don't want to get too heavy because, of course, it's going to be in an overhead bin. Uh, and, of course, with, uh, with these, I, I love the Mac Mini. Mac Mini is uh, my primary machine when it comes to that. And, I'm, of course, I'm going to be getting the M2 coming very soon because I can put on, because uh, I use Wirecast when it comes to uh, doing any type of switching. And so I can put that on there very easily. But what I'll also do is I will bring in my MacBook Pro and I'll use that as the connection screen. Uh, if I'm not near my, uh, if I'm not near my system, then I can use that to, to connect. We talked about that last hour on, on things like that. So I also have an Intel nook in there a uh, pc because uh, there are a lot of things uh, i did a lot of graphics uh they're all pc based software so i have that in there as a secondary or a backup you can use capture cards i can use ndi i can use a lot of different things with that but two computers inside of that case to begin with a little shelf works perfect we i talked about this a couple days ago uh, this is the gl inet this is the newest version the wi-fi 6. it's a router that uh 
basically sets all your IP addresses. Technically, you don't need this if you if you're setting things up. But if you want to have static, or, I'm sorry, uh, DHCP set up, then this router is perfect. You can you can get those all your cameras and all your computers set up to their IP addresses and go from there. The switch is what is really important in my gear. I have this is the TP Link. This is a eight port, four of them PoE power over Ethernet because the cameras that I have our power over ethernet. That way I don't have to bring their power cords with them. That saves a lot of space on my fly kit. But then I, of course I can plug in three cameras, two computers and anything else that I need to. Uh, speaking of computers, I also bring a Raspberry Pi or two just in case you never know when you need an extra thing. Uh, and especially with, uh, with Playout B, uh, that's a great way to add to that and keep it low key. Cameras, PTZ. I use PTZ optics cameras. We got uh, we got a three camera system, uh, so we can uh, p- position everything. Since uh, it's basically a one or two person operation, it's easy to uh, set them up and then and then go from there. And then that way, yeah, I don't have to stand up, walk over to a camera and position. I do have one camera. Uh, that's my Sony camera that will uh that's static in the middle there and then of course uh for the uh for the mac mini if i'm not using my laptop i'm using this this is the viewsonic td 1655 it's a touch screen and touch screens do work on macs now and the best part about this is and i'm showing that on the bottom here is that kickstand because a lot of these portable monitors have the the basically their cases become their stands and i don't like that this gives me an actual kickstand so I don't. I can take that case, that top case off if I want to, and it's not going to fall down. And then, of course, Stream Deck is is the biggest thing out of it. This is the last thing. Uh, the okay. Stream Deck is the We're biggest thing time. out of it, and it's it's just an amazing thing. So these are the things. And of course, I didn't get in the sound. I didn't get, but mm-hmm. all of this fits into my Pelican case into che- one check bag under fifty pounds, which is great. Mm-hmm. And. I just wanted to say that I, saw, I showed a bunch of big fly kits. I just want to show you what I started with uh, real quick. Just one image. That was my first fly kit. Um, it fit into a 1510. <laughs> and I wired it all up for Jamie Oliver. So anyway, so that was that was uh, over 10 years ago. So so it, it, it's if you think that we're, you know, that you jump into fly kits, you you evolve into fly kits. Uh, go ahead, Bill. Yeah, um, we use a lot of the SKB stuff, uh, SKB, the smaller ones like Jeffrey was showing. Uh, I kind of lean into when I'm building, you know, a, a fully functional kit, I kind of lean into the 16 RUs. Yeah. Um, they're they're big enough. You can you can fit if you try, you can fit two on a pallet because uh, we normally have to ship using SOS, something right. like that. And they're under um, 50 inches, right? 52 inches is the. Yeah. They can they can fly on a plane if if you need them right. to. Well, they all can um, fly on a plane. It's just that some are twice <laughs> as expensive. <laughs> yeah, I know I know you have thoughts about this, but I I lean into uh, patch panels. I love patch Anything panels. Anything that goes in and out of the uh, router has to hit patch first. Um, let's see here. You can see I normally go with the two power uh, distributions just because most of our gear has redundant power supplies, so I can mm-hmm. put uh, you know one of the powers on each you know, or, or can separate the circuits yep. um we have kvms you know the, the general stuff i have a shelf over here behind uh, the one RU fans and that's where i've got a couple of raspberry pis i've got a nook i've got a mac mini a bunch of just utility you know helpful pcs there uh this is the back it's it's not cleaned up in this picture but it cleans up pretty nice um you know, one thing I think that people underestimate too is a lot of times we have in in our kit, we have a case that is literally just shelves, you know, shelves and, you know, like just all the stuff, the cameras, the tripods, everything might go into another rack, you know, like it looks like a rack, like it just comes in the same size as everything else, but we just pull out shelves and, and, and everything else. And I think people underestimate the value of that, you know, of having them just all, you know, you're just bringing your whole thing again with you. And it is, again, it's a more expensive thing. A lot of our stuff was serviced in the Bay Area. So we were able to, we just had uh, three trucks, <laughs> you know, so we would just latch them in and take them to where they needed to go pretty much anywhere in the country um, you know, as that kind of got went down. Anything else, Bo? That's all for now. I'll get into a couple more pictures later. Cool. Uh, John? I've determined that uh, this fascination is a disease. You start off with a couple of laptops like Alex, (laughs) and you get a fly pack. Then you get a bigger rolling fly pack. Then you get a trailer. And before you know it, you're in a 2110 trailer, just like Bo Cordell. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Go ahead, Oliver. Yeah, if it's okay to show uh, the 
the uh, the one you're using. This is the one I'm using, or uh, and I plan to upgrade it now. I'm I'm taking it to a trade show in the United States next week, um, and I'm I'm gonna get rid of the uh, all the SDI and HDMI input because I'm I'm going to NDI only. So I, it makes it much easier to set up. Um, because you just have to run one cable to the camera. There's also power and uh, and and video and control over that cable. Um, there's a, a, a little Mac Mini in there with a with a, with a, a rack mount, uh, and that's going to get upgraded to the M2. Uh, the Presonos I'm using bef because uh, the the connectors are conveniently on the front, and also are the the dials and the the blue thing that you see up the blue silver thing. That's the uh, industrial um, uh, LTE router uh, that I'm using, and uh, the the last thing up there is the Sonnet, um, uh, a Sonnet thing that uh, has a basically has um, a Thunderbolt to PCIe, and there's two cards in it, uh, two Blackmagic cards. Uh, one is the Duo Two, and one is the Quad uh, 4K HDMI capture cards so i in theory i would have four sdi in and four hdmi in and a, a whole bunch of um, uh, ndi uh, poe uh, connections uh, so that's what what i'm using for that's great little um, pack. you know yeah that's really nice very very cons you know and what can you re repeat what the audio interface is there you're using uh, that's the uh, Prisonos uh, Quantum twenty six twenty six, uh, and and it's it's uh, I like it because of um, all the connectors that I need are on the front, and yeah. also the uh, the gain dials, and it's uh, uh, Thunderbolt instead of USB, which which I also like. And uh, we're going to now jump into the questions. Uh, one note for for uh, the panelists is be concise. Uh, there's a lot of questions. <laughs> so we've got, this is a very popular subject. Uh, let's go to the first question. Morgan Price in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. What's your smallest good quality fly pack you take when you know you have to be a single remote presenter while you're away? What gear are you packing in 2023 for audio, camera, lighting? Uh, go ahead, Oliver. Yeah, so I built uh, I built a small one that I can take on the road. Uh, looks like this. Um, it's basically um, a MacBook in the middle. Uh, there's these uh, things that um, do additional um, uh, additional screens to the left and the right. And I use the iPhone as a camera, and I have uh, two um, uh, two lights up there to light myself. An iPad for um, for remote control and one iPad for running a presentation, and uh, so that's that's uh, you know all fits into uh, one one uh, you know backpack basically. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, so I'm going to do this real quick. But uh, decades ago, I used to be in fly packs like this all the time. Backstage, there would be Video Village with exactly the kind of things you just saw. About uh, nine years ago, I was in a presentation for Deloitte and it freaked me out because that was gone and there were three laptops in the back of the room and some kind of encoder feeding directly to the internet for a very low res thing but I remember thinking wait all that that I used to be around is in this now so I've been really interested in what people like Keenan and Guy are doing with the remote mobile kind of thing we're not entirely there yet but I, you can just kind of see on the horizon that those kind of things are going to be a big deal going forward so I look uh, do, can I do something on an iPhone phone with maybe a couple of flat panel lights, particularly audio. Can I find a way to get a hardwired uh, rather than wireless signal in? Mm -hmm. And I think we're heading in that direction. Yeah. I'd rather have three Drake cast panels than a gigantic lighting system if I can get away with it. Go ahead, Jeffrey. My smallest fly pack uh, when I go to South Korea or uh, overseas, uh, I will definitely have either the Mac Mini and the uh, MacBook Pro because that's a great combination to, for uh, both uh, both devices. Uh, we got the OBSBOT, which is a 4K. This is a uh, 2.5 inch sensor, so it's not a great sensor, but for what I'm doing, it's perfect from there. I also have uh, for remote. I do a lot of NDI, so of course, uh, using the uh, Logitech Mevo Plus is a great little camera because then I can use it to actually point at products, like if somebody's showing me something. So a two-camera system from there, good good audio. So I got the wireless, uh, the Sony wireless uh, PO3D. This is a dual lav, which works great, or I can put it onto a handheld. 
And then uh, this year, I'm, I believe it or not, yes, I am going to try the YOLO Live YOLO Box. Uh, mm -hmm. The YOLO Box Pro, they've, they've just done some great firmware updates, which uh, I'm hoping are really going to add to my uh, presentation. Next question. Next question in from George E. Kennedy Jr. from Washington, D.C. How many variations of fly packs are there? I consider one to be a two-unit SKB case with a switcher, three recorders, and an encoder that I can carry on a flight. Go ahead, Bo. Yeah, you, you showed a couple of uh, kind of big fly, fly kits earlier. Um, you know, I'll, I'll show one that I got to work on several years. I didn't design this one, but I got to uh, engineer and tech manage uh, the show for a couple of years. But basically... We were at a tennis facility, um, a pretty big tennis tournament, and we turned this room right here into master control. So it went from this to this in the course of a day. It took us a couple, you know, a couple more days to wire everything up and make it work. Um, but we, you know, within the period of about four or five days, it went from an empty room to a fully functional master control room that powered a giant jumbotron, uh, kind of on the courtyard of the facility, and then also three remote stadium control rooms. So the three biggest uh, courts. So uh, this was our rack room. So it started as this, and then the next day it looked like that. So this is a pretty big fly kit from uh, PRG put this together at VER at the time. And we had two engineering workstations. So this was my desk. Uh, and you can see all this stuff basically came in on two 42 foot straight trucks and uh, all the furniture. So this was one of the stadium facilities. So. Uh, you can see that the monitors are coming in on a rolling rack. That I think they built it. It's like an X frame that they built in house. Uh, so it's a pretty, pretty crazy setup where we basically build control rooms in three completely different stadiums, wire them all with fiber, and uh, and make it all work. This was the the dead the dead zone. So these were all <laughs> the the coffin cases went. Uh, but yeah, it's it's you know I would call this the biggest fly pack that I've ever worked on before you get to a truck for sure. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Go ahead, Jeff. Me and Bo would get along so well. That <laughs> that's right down my my realm. Uh, we we love uh, doing those big builds like that. We just start from nothing and then just build everything you need. Our latest flight pack, as I'll call it, is actually a twenty foot container. I have three of them at the shop right now, and we're in finishing up our first one. So I don't have pictures of it yet, but uh, I will be glad to share them with the class later. But that's my small flight pack that we're going to be flying with. Yeah, and we we had a 24-foot trailer that we is almost a flight kit. It's not really a truck. You know, it's like a it's like a flight kit that or or a fly kit that can be drove, driven around. The um uh for me there the number of variations is infinite because we tended to build our flight our we tended to build our fly packs custom to ev almost every show. So we had a warehouse, we'd put them together, we then send them out. Um, and that's kind of how, so we, you know, we wanted them to be a mission specific uh, for most of what we did because we were doing really complicated shows. Next question. Jack Cannon from Phoenix, Arizona. What are your favorite budget conscious shock mount road racks looking for around a 10 unit, $300, $600 budget? Go ahead, Jeff. There is a SKB in that line. Uh, just be be prepared that when you buy the shock mounts, you need to look at how much weight you're putting in it. If you don't have enough weight, the shock is irrelevant. And if you have too much weight, the shock is irrelevant to protection. You need to make sure you look at that, uh, especially the ones that have the frame that's floating inside the plastic case. And the wood ones that are just like two inches of foam, maybe even the cheap ones, especially, or like an inch, maybe an inch and a quarter worth of foam, they're useless. So uh, the real shock mounts or SKB more expensive than what you're budgeting for that. Yeah, go ahead, Bo. Yeah, probably not uh, relevant for Jack, but the SKB cases that we use, the the 16 RUs, they are they do come stock with just the four rubber shocks, um, and they're only rated to about 150 pounds. With our machines, we generally get over that. So they they do sell an expansion kit where you can add four more shock mounts to up the rating to like 350 pounds. Um, so next question. Gordon Lake in Los Angeles. Any recommendations for a rack mount power strip with on off switches for each outlet? Each outlet. 
I was trying. I I, I thought, oh, on off switch, yeah, sure, Furman. But but then you said each outlet, and I was like, oh, I don't I don't know. Um, you know what's funny is is that that's really popular in the UK. So in the UK, you get all these strips that are all like a switch for each one of them. Um, it's not a not as popular with uh, US uh, mounts. Go ahead, Jeff. There is there's a couple of them from uh, like lighting manufacturers, uh, Chave, AD, uh, American DJ. They have them. Uh, I don't trust them because their switches are really cheap, and they sometimes will rock in the middle. So we stopped using those years ago. Uh, the The way to get individual outlets now to be able to trigger them on and off is with a UPS and the UPS with a better UPS. It's going to take a pure sine wave most likely with a uh, a multi zone. Uh, outfit so that you can actually turn it on and off yeah in server rooms we have pdus that you can turn it off by network um so there's a lot of different ways to do that as well go ahead uh, bill exactly what jeff said i use one from elation here every day and i wouldn't trust them in a in a high use environment for me they've been fine for the last 10 years but they're not huge quality but they do work when you get into mission critical events uh that you stop looking for the cheapest version of things uh, go ahead uh, keenan so uh, if you search on Amazon, I don't have the link, but a Pile PDU, uh, again, you you know, buyer beware. I don't know if Pile is a brand you want to use, but they do make one that has nine power switches and nine outlets. But uh, and I think they're $60, $80. So I, I'm not going to give you a recommendation. I'm just saying they're out there. Next question. Guy Cochran in Seattle, USA. Do you build with failure in mind? Go ahead, Jeffrey. Always. <laughs> it, it, well, in my in my case, I'm always tearing apart and rebuilding my kits, uh, depending on what's going on. And uh, you never know when uh, you need to rebuild a, a last flood. Like, for instance, when I was in Barcelona in November, my Pelican case did not show up till after the event. So a lot of the stuff was really hodgepodge. The biggest thing that I always uh, recommend to everybody is to spend an hour and look at the location that you're going to find out where all the electronic stores are, find out the hours that they are open. Because if you need to run there to get something to add to whatever uh, to fix or whatever you can, then you can do that in a timely manner. Go ahead, Bill. Yeah, always. Uh, the the key that's that's really why I lean on patch panels in all of my kits. I always throw a black magic, uh, you know, throw down monitor on the front of my rack with a patch cord dangling there, so I can always you know plug into the to the patch panel and quickly troubleshoot, figure out where where we're losing signal, where we're not. Go, ahead, Jeff. I agree with both the gentleman and also uh, would add uh, redundancy. And when you pack your flight packs, try to make sure that everything that goes with that system is with that system. So if you have a bag full of laptops, for instance, don't put the power supplies in another bag. Put them in the same bag. So if you lose them all, <laughs> it's so real. you lose them all at once. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, that's been I, probably the number one thing we were looking around for is the, is the laptop power supplies. Like, where? who put them in another? And there's always someone now, yelling. The new one that's the Mickey Mouse, the three-way one, that's not, you know, I have 5,000 IECs. Actually, we counted them last week. We have 5,000 in the shop. The little Mickey Mouse one only goes to the laptops. So have those little adapters also. C thirteen. Find an IEC, but you can't find that. IEC. IEC are all the cables. C thirteen is the is that is the cable that we're looking for. Yeah, I'm I'm always we we always we that's in the back. We always argue about that all the time. Um. Anyway, the um uh yeah we almost all of our kits are have an entire parallel pipeline. So audio, video. Uh, it may not be as good as the primary pi pipeline, but it is another one. Like we have a second switcher there. We and one of the big reasons we like Black Magic is because I could buy two constellations for the price of another switcher, and so I have so I have two of them in there, and I can switch them. And that's what I like when Bo showed those patch panels, being able to hard patch. Like so, if my router goes down, I can I literally had an engineer save a show by hard patching um, the. Um, hard patching everything, the camera's all back in when the router crashed, you know, like, so, so there is, uh, you know, having those hard patches is really, really important. Um, uh, anyway, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I know that one F doesn't think I belong here because I'm just an editor, but, um, when I travel to edit, I always, um, I pack and ship or, you know, take as luggage, my primary edit system but I always, keeping in mind failure, uh, I always carry enough stuff on my back that I could do the whole job um, if I had to. I don't prefer, I, I really don't like editing on laptops. I think it's yeah. it's cruel and inhumane, probably deserves extra pay. But um, 
but I do have that as a backup. And somewhere I have a video of uh, the baggage handlers picking up my iMac Pro in a case and throwing it onto the luggage uh, a little wagon that's going to take it to the terminal. Like it caught air. I was like, oh, yeah. Oh, I, I'm I used so to glad shoot, I have a spare. I used to shoot videos of that when we were traveling and I could see our case. You could always see our cases loading because like 27 Pelican cases are suddenly coming in. And I would shoot video of the of the baggage handlers throwing it um, so I could show it to the guys at the warehouse. Like when you pack it, just I just want to make this sure is how you see. Pack. This is, this is the, just know that this is what's happening to them. Next question. Morgan Price in Victoria, British Columbia, Canada. Assume you're going to spec out a 15,000-ish fly pack for an intimate two to three person live stream. You've got microphones and three Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera 6Ks already, thanks to office hours. What would you put in the pack? Go ahead, Bill. First thing I look at is lighting. What kind of lighting am I going to bring to take care of two or three persons? I would go with light panels. More than likely, I'd pack Astras just because they're small enough. Oh, I would be so happy if I got on set and there were Geminis there because they can solve almost every problem in lighting for two or three people that I've ever run into. But that's up to up to you. At fifteen thousand dollars, I probably rent the lights locally because I, you know, because I, I wouldn't want to expend the money on them and ship them. Shipping lights and and their supports are a pain. So I would probably just save that money there. Um, but otherwise, I'd probably use NAN lights because they're about a quarter of the cost of a lot of the other ones. And that's what I use a lot of for, for those kinds of things. Um, the, you know, an extreme switcher would be fine, like a, a Blackmagic Extreme, since you already have the Blackmagic cameras. So, be, you know, so the extreme switcher is going to give you that, that uh, super source if you need it and a lot more creature comforts. Um, the mixer, you know, a... You know, a uh, I mean, it depends on how your mics are set up, if they're, you know, and, and what they're enabled for. But a small mixer that is either a 1U, X, an XR18 would probably do a good job. Um, so those are things to think about related to that. You're going to want a couple laptops that are going to, or Mac minis that are going to supply some um, stuff, you know, whether it's graphics or, or images and so on and so forth. And that'd probably be all you need to put, put one of those things together. Next question. Ronnie Hofsey from Tromso, Norway, asking, building a new compact fly pack around the ATEM 2ME Constellation HD, what is your favorite additional items to put into it besides multi-view display, recorders, I.O. back panel, and maybe a switch router access point? Go ahead, Jeff. I start with now the router. Start mm -hmm. with, a, with an HD STI router first, and then bring out patch bays on the back side when i said patch bays a, a patch panel not actually a hard patch bay like uh, bo showed I, I don't personally use those i use the router as that point uh and then start from there but the router is what we build everything for and if you think you need 16 by 32 if you think you need 32 by 144 because you will fill it up as i just did on my latest rack Routers are like bags. You'll just fill up whatever you have. If you've got 188 you'll, or 144 or 288, you'll just fill those up too. You know, just because you just and it just is a better show. <laughs> so um, I start with most of these. I start with 40 by 40. Um, since you're already in a black magic world, I, I would start with a 40 by 40 router. Um, remember that you have to figure out. You know, usually I have a Terranex or two in there just because it's just kind of a Swiss Army knife. If someone gave me something I didn't expect. Um, so those are other things to think about and lots and lots and lots of monitors um, and a couple, uh, most of my kits have four Mac minis in them because they're kind of like glue that I just, and I don't get, I just get the 599, now 599 versions of them, just glue to kind of add graphics, uh, relays, whatever I need to do. Next question. Jesse Mills, San Francisco Bay Area. What's the weight difference between an NDI based pack and an SDI based pack? Oliver. I think that depends. If you look at mine, for example, I can get rid of uh, two uh, HU at the top and those two HU with the uh, Sonnet thing are actually taking up most of the weight of this thing. I would say more than half. And the other thing you have to um, take into account is, of course, cables. Uh, you know, Ethernet cables are much lighter than uh, SDI cables, and you only need one cable. You don't need all the power supplies to the cameras and stuff like that. Uh, the PTC cameras are also very not very heavy, uh, unless you take the big ones from Panasonic or something. But the you know the the ones that are in the mid market um, are not very heavy. And and as, as I said, you you need much less cables, and that's um, a big difference. Go ahead, Jeff. Take it from there, from definitely uh, much less cable in uh, going the NDI route because you're going over IP, but I'm also going over fiber a lot of times too. 
So a uh, fiber reel that's 500 feet long, 1,000 feet long is 20, 30 pounds at most. And I'm doing a lot longer runs with that and a lot higher bandwidth at that point too. So uh, yes, this is substantially better. All right, go ahead, uh, Jeff. Jeffrey. Yeah, this is what this is what I used to take with me uh, for a lot of my shows, and I had I can get rid of that in the rack, and then of course, the Wi-Fi. The biggest thing is don't think of NDI as a Wi-Fi thing. Make sure that you have the ability to uh, cable it up if you can, because that's going to be very important. That that keeps a connection, and you're not uh, you're not losing frames simply because you got uh, your triangle over Wi-Fi. Next question. Chris Sabato in Albany, Oregon. Any suggestions for a shallow four-unit rack case? I'm using an SKB and the cover clips frequently unlatch themselves. You know, SKB kind of, <laughs> they kind of own that space. Go ahead, Bo. Yeah, I would just say try a different SKB. Try the ones that uh, <laughs> that are, that just fit into a Pelican or fit into an SKB case, but it's just the the wire you know, frame, not the the one with the cover clip that I think you're talking about yeah. um, that Jeffrey showed earlier. So I, I would just try a different one. Yeah, go ahead, Jeff. I, I when it comes to small things like that, I I, I go to real racks uh, and walk away from the SKBs because they're racks, they're they're clips, and that those smaller, cheaper cases are just terrible. They the just worst part is if you buy a four U a four UME uh, from SKB. I bought them in two different years. They look identical except that the lids don't match. <laughs> so you had to mark them very carefully uh, to to make sure that that were actually worked. Uh, the other thing to look at is the is the the there is the the SKBs that just drop into a they 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 are in they pull out and they're just the frame and those latches work a lot better and then those frames stack much better and they're much smaller and so um, I like to I don't like to I don't sh when I want to ship something I ship the ones with the frames inside of the foamed cases and then you pull them out and stack them all up and it, it and those those are a lot easier to use at all different sizes next question. Ronnie Hofsey in Tromso, Norway, building a Zoom ISO rack as an add-on module for a main mixer vision switcher rack, including a Mac Mini M or 1 or 2, Sonitech with a Blackmagic design deck link card and back panel. What more and how to structure it? Multi-viewer, main display, drawer for ke ke keyboard and mouse. Drawers. <laughs> Drawers are good. Um, again, the router is going to be import important. Um, you just people even even if you get a atem that has a you know a whole bunch of ins and outs you need something else to manage the, the routes so um that router um and then you're going to want to think about do you want to record isos do you want to of, of everything um do you want and i guess you could use the iso inside of the zoom thing i have separate recorders for those um so and then frame converters you just need a frame converter or two is the thing that i usually start thinking about next question George E. Kennedy Jr. in Washington, D.C. Should fly packs be built with speedy setups in mind? We may not always have the luxury of the day before setup. Go ahead, Chris. Um, absolutely. Uh, think about it. it. This is your one chance in this business where you get to like really organize down to the cable level. Uh, I built a, a big audio rig um, several years ago that um, I think I counted between the audio. This is, uh, by the way, this is Alex's nightmare, all analog, all copper. But between the, the audio console and my effects rack, I think I had like, uh, I want to say like 60 or 70 connection points. And if you divide those up by, you know, tip ring and sleeve, that's it was like 140 individual wires, essentially. And it was all done on whirlwind mass connectors. And I could, uh, with uh, one giant 56 pin bink go out to the stage and then three more little um uh, connectors back to the back of my audio rack i could set the entire system up in once i had the lids off uh i could set the entire system up in like 90 seconds like literally 90 seconds literally and not only not only did it go quicker but it was more consistent like every time i set it up everything worked now if you're doing bespoke setups like Alex, you can't, you know, pre-wire all that stuff. But definitely think about, are, am I going to be able to set up quickly? Am I going to be able to set up consistently? And and, and to be specific, I, I do that. We do think about we pre-wire everything, <laughs> like you know, so we like so we build the kit so that it, it can be set up quickly. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, I was just teasing you about it. This was literally the kind of audio that would uh, make your brain melt. It was just analog. It was There wasn't a single digital uh, anything in, in all this stuff, but it was a lot of copper. Go ahead, Oliver. Yeah, so um, the... Um, the uh, the the flight kit I showed earlier, when we set that up with NDI, it takes us, you know, like an hour or so to get it working. And, uh, you know, it gives this sort of, it makes the production more relaxed if you don't have, you know, to factor in hours and hours and hours and tiring setup. So that's, um, you know, definitely uh, speedy setups is, uh, is an important thing. Right, Jeffrey? Not only speedy setups, but speedy resetups. If you have a multi-day shoot and you got to take down things and then put them back up the next day, you want to make sure that uh, that the connections are solid. You don't have a problem in between day one and day two as you're going. So I I put uh, reset up speedy reset up in my thoughts process. Go, ahead, Jeff. For um, our past experiences, multi-mass connectors, uh, if any of you know what that is, or very dense uh, audio snake connectors that have like hundreds of pins in them, they were great to make interconnects between racks work, but when that one breaks, that's all your audio in it, and you have to fix that before you could do anything else, That that's a bad thing. So be careful about optimizing to the point that your optimization is depending on your optimization in order to work. So uh, that's a big thing I would suggest is not using too much to shortcut. You want patch panels with things labeled. Yes, that's a key, but don't, don't put everything all in one basket, I guess what I'd say. Yeah, and, and some of those ones, the ones you saw at the White House there, our setup time was two and a half hours. So I mean, it, 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 we think a lot about feature as well as speed. Um, and if we have anything specialized, what Jeff was talking about, we have backups. So that's what those cases are in the back. Um, we have extra um, cards for our, our cross points, our cross point cards for our, our routers. We have extra, you know, all these things. There's, a, there's one, a couple cases full of anything that we can't buy at Guitar Center or at or at Computer Central or whatever is in a box somewhere that that, that is going to replace things that, that get run over we've had our fiber of course run over by forklifts that's that's the most common problem that we have um next question guy cochran in seattle washington how would you use memo live in a fly pack i go ahead oliver well i've already showed a couple of examples uh, i have uh, the I, I do a new 4hu uh with the m2 mac mini and remove the uh sdi and hdmi stuff part and put it in a smaller uh uh, case and uh, take it on a plane and try to fly across the Atlantic with it. So let's see how that works out. Go ahead, uh, Keenan. I'm sorry. Next question. I jumped Jack to the next Cannon. question and then said Keenan. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Nick. Go ahead. Next. Jack question. Cannon from Phoenix, Arizona. Do you ever use carts with your flyaway kits? Uh, go ahead, Keenan. Okay, so Fenwick came up with this idea called Sandhopper. Sandhopper.com is what what he. Uh, he thought was the cool thing to do. I'm going to show you what we're designing. If my, there we go. So this is a two by three cart. It has a DC battery in the bottom and a handle here, which isn't represented on the drawing. Um, and then we're building a shelf for the production area. We're going to put a monitor for program preview. The action cameras will be on the end. And then our flat mount Starlink will actually be in the top of it. So the Sandhopper is a pretty cool base platform. We're working with them right now, but it's actually a motorized, it, they said it'll go 25 miles on battery. So for those of you that are against pulling your carts, uh, this may be a good option. So stay tuned, we're gonna build this. This is primarily for overlanding. So we wanna use the cart and have everything pre-built on it, ATAM monitors. So it'll be a pretty neat little flyaway kit and then uh fenwick's showing you the actual cart. yeah this thing is the tesla of wagons if you ever wanted to have the coolest wagon on the block this is the thing to get it's motorized it has a throttle and a brake on that handle there it's super cool maybe not included all right <laughs> go ahead jeff or you could just use your tesla either way i have a a great idea about the, the flight pack things I, I most of our cases had wheels on them uh, SKBs and Pelicans, if you drag them through mud, the wheels don't do so well. And gravel and stuff over time, it gets and gums them up, right? So they stop running. So we bought some of the uh, rock and roller 
uh, is is a brand name. So from the DJ day, so it's a rock roller. It's a, it's a dolly that expands out and it's got four good size wheels on it. So you can go over multiple things. Gator makes them now. We bought one of those and it, it was actually one of my guys had it and I bought it from him. I was like, I love it. We're keeping it. And in, we ended up buying like two or three of them. Even with the cases with wheels on them, I'm still using those rollers just because it makes it that much easier. I have been eyeing exactly what Keenan was saying and doing something similar to that because it there's times we have some really heavy loads and uh, having something motorized to help move you around. Yeah, why not? Yeah, after destroying probably five or 10 of the rock and rollers, uh, Marty Brennan said, why don't we just get a Cartmaster? And I was like, uh, what's a Cartmaster? And he's like, oh, HD 500, Cartmaster HD 500. And I bought one and then I bought six. Um, we check them and they literally fold up into almost nothing and we just check them with the bag. So we have, we'll have 40, 40 cases and, and three or four cart masters that go out together. And then they just, they just come back in, we unfold them and, and put everything on them when we're, when we're at, the, at the airport. They're like a, they're like a rock and roller. They're just a lot beefier and a lot more expensive <laughs> to, to get them, but they're, um, they're like tanks. Uh, go ahead, Jeffrey. For me, uh, no, it, taking a cart's just extra. So it, we'd use the airport carts to get get the uh, product to the car. Uh, then hotel, uh, we uh, use their carts. There's been a couple hotels that have actually had carts that we could use after the fact. But uh, then we find a hardware store and we get a collapsible truck or a flatbed uh, uh, roller. And then we use that and then we just either give it to the hotel or discard it when we're done. Just like with a lot of power cords, because you just don't have the space to take them with you. Uh, it's easier just to get them at the location. One of the things that uh, we did before we had the cart masters and we were checking them is that we took pictures of every single uh, airport cart because some of them have front lips and we would have it, we would put like, this is Pittsburgh, this is Dubai, this is, you know, Br um, you know, Sao Paulo or whatever. And they're all different. And we wanted to know how long they were and whether they had a front lip. The front lip is just devastating <laughs> on, on, on an airport cart. Um, I'm going to, we're going to keep bringing people in, but try to keep it quick because we're running, we're, we're going to go over time. Uh, go ahead, uh, Bill. I had to shoot once on Canyon de Shea up in the Navajo Nation, and I had to come in on a really small plane. So the only cart that actually made sense to me was to get something like this little cart -a bag um, tiny fold-up. It's great because you can travel on things with it. It was able to stow in there. I had that plus a small table that I would, you know, kind of a resin table that I took with me to form a little quick instant video village, and that helped a lot. So I like those for short-run things. Yeah, go ahead, Bo. Yeah, the only other thing I would add is look at a company called Innovative, uh, and they make carts uh, that fold down pretty easily. They can, you know, have accessories and monitors and whatnot, so they're a pretty good company too. Yeah, and if you go to filmtools.com um, and look at carts, there's so many, so many options, and it's it's Film Tools is probably the most second most dangerous place for me to go, other than B and H uh, to to visit. Next question. Justin James, Phoenix, Arizona, asking, when you need to fly to an event, how do you get your fly pack there? Heard horror stories of airlines breaking latches and losing gear. Uh, go ahead, Bo. All right, so not me, but a, uh, a show that I worked on. It's a pretty big show. Uh, they fly these things, or actually they ship these. Uh, so this is a, it's one of several that NBC uses for their Olympics coverage for their IBC. And if you see, you can see uh, all these racks are built on a sled that fits in a shipping container uh it's and it powers the their broadcast operations center so uh that's you that's know, the, you can the little on version a boat. Of, you know it's yeah. cute it's cute that's it on one end of the scale you, yeah, yeah, you exactly. don't trust the plane put it on a boat yeah exactly go ahead jeffrey yeah my cat's a, just a little bit smaller than that uh so a lot of times i just have to fly with it, especially if you're going internationally because if you do it internationally and you do anything other than bring it to you uh, through a plane, it's going to take at least two months uh, to get across the sea. Uh, so you'd have to pre-plan, do some great pre-planning for that. Yeah, so a couple things about this. I'm going to take a minute to unpack this, so to speak. Um, so a couple things is when we're flying with them, uh, when we're flying with them, we use Pelican cases um, almost all almost all the way across or the SKBs. We use colored zip ties on the holes. Um, and the reason we use colored ones is because TSA uses clear ones. And so if we see any case with a clear uh, zip tie, you know that TSA opened it and that's the first one you open to make sure it's okay. If, you know, so if... 
if you're picking them all up and you've got a day or two before the event in Japan, you open all the clear ones first to make sure that the TSA didn't break anything. They're the TSA is the number one thing that breaks things is TSA opening and shutting your stuff. The way to keep TSA from opening and breaking your things is to pack them for TSA. Don't pack them for as tight as you can possibly make them. Pack them, we put, um, uh, uh, we put Velcro on the edges of our monitors and then we snap uh, plastic across the front of them and then we pack them <laughs> because then you don't break our monitors. Um, and so those are the kind of things that you wanna do and you wanna um, have clear lists of what's in every single case. I mean, I think our record is about 42, 43 cases to go to be checked um, into, into it. Um, so you wanna kind of keep track of what's going where. If you're doing international, you'll need that for the Carnet anyway. Um, the Carnet is mostly a trust thing. They're only gonna look at a couple things. And so you, the more organized you are, the less things they look at. If you will, if you ask for something you, and they ask for it and you open it up and you go, this case and you open it up and show it to them, they're like, okay, never mind. <laughs> like, you know, like they, 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 they're, they're doing this. And so um, those, those are things to think about there. Um, the other thing to think about is getting priority. So your cases don't get lost when you're priority. And so what we do is we kind of force everybody that works with Pixel Core, we forced everybody to use United and we wanted to build them up so that they were 1K users because once you had the priority tag, the chances of it getting lost were very, very low. Um, and so, and then the other thing to remember is that if you're using Pelican cases, you can get a press pass. And how do you get a press pass? You have a badge printer <laughs> and you just say media, uh, the media pass in most of these. I can say this now because I don't travel very much. Um, I, cause we would never tell the secret that you can just print your own media passes. You make it look official. Um, and it's $50 a bag up to hundred pounds, um, to get them out. Um, 70 pounds international. Um, uh, so those are the, you know, it's a lot cheaper to move a ton or two of gear in and out of it. Um, the United baggage handlers hate you, but United is the best one. Southwest does something as well. Um, you know, um, uh, American or whatever they call now. It's horrible. So anyway, so that's why we we focused on United because, uh, because of that. Anyway, those are some things to think about. Once you grow up a little bit more and you aren't checking things anymore, then you're using SOS or Red or Rocket. Um, Rocket is the SOS is the I find the more cost effective way to do it. Um, Rocket is the luxurious. It will show up where you asked it to show up to the minute. <laughs> so so you know, and they'll manage all the carnet and all the other bits and pieces and everything else um, to to make that go. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. My biggest trick is donut holes. I travel with a bag of donut holes. And when I show up at the curb, I hand it to the main valet. Yeah, and I'm go. like, I have 45 cases that have to get to Jamaica. What yeah. can I do to help you? I pay, uh, I pay $2 a bag. So when I, when it's at the air, if the air hop brings it in, they're going to get a big, they're going to get 40 bucks or 60 bucks or whatever it is. And I want to make sure that the next time they see me, they're excited to see me not running. So, um, so that definitely, uh, you know, you want to make, uh, Make that that actually work for them. All right. I made the uh, mistake of letting my producer tip the bell guy. Oh yeah. And he comes back into the airport. And he goes, "Hey, I, I gave him ten yeah, bucks. You think yeah. that's enough? Forty five bags. I walked right out. And I peeled off a yeah. hundred bucks. I said, thanks for your time.' You tips are a huge grease at airports that you want to use a lot. Like you know, it's just it, you know, especially if you're going to use the airport over and over again. Those guys don't. They're still there the next time you come. Um, you know, so, you know, like, so like, you know, and then they'll, and if you take 20 bags at a time, they know who you are. Um, so anyway, you want them to be jockeying to, to work with you, not, not the other way around. Um, uh, next question. Chris Widener, Lafayette, Indiana. Is anyone else using the Swan Flight cases with black magic switchers? My primary has an ISO extreme and two Mac minis. I've never heard of Swan Flight. Uh, is it Swan Flight cases? Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll do some more research on that. It sounds sounds interesting. Next question from Jesse Mills in the San Francisco Bay Area. What's the best pan tilt zoom camera to put in a fly pack where the subject will be at fifty plus feet distance? Tell us why, if you will. Go, ahead, Jeff. Since you said best, there is the very popular uh, UE one fifty from Panasonic, and now the new UE one sixty. Those are the ten to twelve thousand uh, dollar price point. If you really want the best, then use a Mark Roberts head like we do with a uh, Panasonic UV three hundred on it or a Grass Valley box camera, and your lens of choice, which go could ahead. go up to about a twenty four. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Jeffrey. Yeah, if you go if you have a twenty x or thirty x uh, uh, optical zoom, then you're you're doing pretty good. I, uh, the hardware con I did uh, a couple of years ago, which was at the hardware museum, 
Alex showed pictures a couple days ago. Um, I had my PTZ optics from the back of the room there, but it's more about the joystick at that point because the farther you get back with a PTZ camera, the more that you have to try and keep people in the frame and they're going to wander around the stage. So you're going to have to move that thing back and forth. So make sure that it has some good joystick access to it. The the best for, for that we've used, and so there there are probably better ones out there. Is a Telemetrics head with a Blackmagic uh, 4K or Blackmagic 4.6 or 12K or whatever with a, a Canon 50 to 1000 millimeter lens on it. Um, those have been the best from 50 feet or more uh, that I've used. Um, the Super 35 makes an incredible difference at that distance. You can't go over 75 feet with a Super 35, in my opinion, because it's too hard to focus um, in most in most areas. But otherwise, um, that's the best. Otherwise. The Panasonics work real exceptionally well. The ones that Jeff talked about, um, just hanging them somewhere, um, you know, to, to to do coverage. But we focus a lot on telemetrics heads. Um, Mark Roberts are s similar, probably better. But the ones that we use um, have been telemetrics. Uh, next question, David Brady, New York, New York. I have my mobile Zoom ISO rig, pretty much built on the innovative Deploy 19 rack unit rack on wheels. The 32-inch Ikigami is a bit too bulky. Are there any alternative lightweight SDI monitors? I mean, I have to admit the ones that I use the most are the Blackmagic rack mounts. You know, so the Blackmagic 12G, I think they're 12G monitors um, that uh, are, are rack mountable have been, they're 17-inch, so they're a lot smaller than the 32 that you're using. Um, but if we're putting them into the rack, they fit nicely um, and they work well. You can do two inputs. You can control them over network as well. Um, so they're they're kind of useful there. Otherwise, we build larger ones that literally come out of the case. So they're, they're in the case. They have hydraulic in the inside and they are motorized and they just come right out, right out of the case. Um, and we put them behind the rack that we're editing with. Uh, next question. Yeah, it's from Douglas Carmichael. Alex, I see you're using SKB racks for small modular systems. Wouldn't ATA cases be a lot better for travel by air? I've heard SKB racks, racks can break easily. Uh, ATA is kind of a general term. Um, it's not really a rack manufacturer, I don't think. Um, I know someone took that term, but that's that's kind of a, a, a general term for stuff. I, I uh, SKB is what we do when we check things. As soon as we get bigger than checking things, we move to uh, custom cases. Um, go ahead, Chris. Yeah, I did a little research on this uh, Swan Flight case. This is why you buy them. You can put a barbecue in them. This is the most important case on your oh cake. Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, a fly kit with a rack mount. <laughs> um, that, oh my, oh, I need, I need. I was, there, by the way, we'll just take a little side. Could, I mean, let's face it, you could build a box around anything you and they have a whole section on their website for hospitality cases. We I had a, a guy. One. We had a we kegerator had a, way above the coffee maker, kegerator. Yeah, the, the kegerator, there's, we had a guy that had a cappuccino machine, like a, Italian cappuccino machine in a rack mount that he would open up and be making people cappuccinos. Well, and, and I got to tell you, you know, it's a great, again, a great way to grease your relationship with everybody is to make, have them be able to walk over and make cappuccinos. And he literally had, he had a PA, their only job was to, was to, um, was to make the cappuccinos. And, and he spent, I kid you not, half a day teaching them how to do the foam perfectly. <laughs> like it was like, he was, he just had him throw the milk away. He went through like three gallons of milk teaching him how to do it. They're like, no, 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 no. You got to hold it at 45 degree angle and a 10 degree angle inside of the, inside of the thing. You got to do, you, you stretch it until 90 degrees and then you, and then you, and then you froth it until 145 degrees. It was like, and I was like, why are you doing that? He's like, because everyone's going to remember it. And he was right. Everyone, everyone, I still remember it. That was 10 years ago. Uh, go ahead, Bill. ATA is the Air Transport Asso yeah. Association. It's been around since the 1930s. So they just have standards for the size and scope of things. Yeah. Next question. Michael Flotron from Portland, Oregon. What is the best way to ship and fly with fly packs that are over 100 pounds? Checked luggage limit. Uh, go ahead, Jeff. You need to become a known shipper or you need to use a freight forwarder like SOS or there's a multitude of them, but SOS is probably the most common for our business and our industry being a known shipper does take many steps interviews and lots of paperwork uh i've been a known shipper with uh, united and also uh, southwest for years but uh it's it's even harder now to get into that it's almost impossible like it's it has become after you know um you know after a variety of of terrorist things not just a lot 9 11 but other things uh it is um it's become a really 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 difficult to to begin a, a known shipper um and so and i will admit that i i hate being a known shipper 
Like I hate it because I hate the idea that I'm gonna have to deal with it. So um, if I'm gonna ship stuff over, I I really I'd rather have it be luggage with folks, or I'd rather if it's over 100 pounds, I just want SOS or Rocket to solve that problem for me. Um, you know, and so um, because dealing with luggage at the where where you have to pick it up is drives me crazy. Next question. Next question is coming in from Andre Dole in Berlin. Some entrepreneurs recommend this mic for kits to send out. Opinions? He's got a link there for them. I saw that mic. I don't know what that mic would be for. Um, I wouldn't use it in production. If it's used for comms, it's fine. But I wouldn't use that as a as my main mic to for someone to talk into. So I'm not entirely sure what that definition would be. If you're looking at a kit to send out for people to use for comms, that looks great. Um, I wouldn't, but I wouldn't use a gooseneck mic for a production. Um, almost period. Next question. And it's from Srikanth Siriam from Chennai, India. What's the process to get into remote control of your fly pack? I go ahead, Bo. Yeah, if we're on site, usually, you know, their racks will be in a different room from the user station. We'll use KVMs. We've, we've used a lot of different ones. I've kind of rely on the Adder XDIPs because they're IP routable, really simple setup. Um, if we're trying to control it from the other side of the world, I'd normally throw a Raspberry Pi in the rack that has a Cloudflare or you know some some form of VPN access to get into the to the rack and hit anything that I need to hit. Go, ahead, Jeff. Combination of both the same two. I'm lit right next to a rack full of Adder uh, back on the back side of it, and then also at the same time we are using VPNs. Ours are Peplinks uh, uh, Speed Fusion for most of our tie-ins together. And I have to admit that I I. I like the creature comforts of Meraki. So all of our kits for a decade have had Meraki's in them um, where where they are just part of the, the they just, as soon as they light up and I can find them even if they're not technically on the internet. <laughs> so so they, they can, as soon as they're plugged into anything that at, remotely touches the internet, I can see them and reconfigure them and make them all work. Um, so the Meraki's have been a really, really powerful thing for us. And we check all of the hardware of every kit into the into all the Meraki's so that all the hardware is set to DHCP, it all gets the same numbers except for the kit change. The kit change. So if you tell me I'm in kit six, I know where everything is inside of that that remote rack immediately. You know, and so I can log into everything as as needed. Um, as far as remote in the same building, um, the thing that we use a lot, or the thing that I've used in the past for a lot of the bigger builds, are IHSE. Um, they make modular fiber uh, extenders, um, and we got into them because that's what what EVS recommended. <laughs> so and then we started using them and then and then uh, then we got stuck with them. We just got addicted to the fact that we could, you know, tell them what we needed and get cards for the extenders to do what we wanted it to do. Next question. From Zach Phillips in Philadelphia and right here on our panel, I find the greatest impediment to keeping kits small and sleek are all those abominable power adapters and wall warts. How do you manage these things, or is there an elegant power solution so that we don't have to live like animals? That's such a great question. Go ahead, Jeff. I, I totally feel your pain all the time. Uh, we have moved to uh, MeanWell uh, is a uh, readily available power supply, and that power supply gets 110, and then it has a bus bar on it that will output 12 volts. And so all the 12-volt devices go to that. I have seen one or two of these power supplies that actually have five volt and 12 volt rails both. So that's effectively a computer power supply, but uh, that's what we're starting to do. And so some of these can be small. They're about this big little silver boxes. We put them inside the racks and then we run all the power cables out of that into it. But they're five amps, which is usually that takes a place of at least five, usually five different devices at that point. Um, but you can get them up to some of ours are 60 amps. Uh, 60 watts, uh, 60, no, I don't think they're 60 amps, but uh, they, they can get up there in size. And it just depends. You have to, the, but that was getting to the point is add up all what you want to replace, figure out how much its draw is, and then buy the appropriate power supply with headroom on top of it. But changing the power supplies out to a master one, though I will caution, if it dies, all of it dies. Yeah. So have to. Have to. Yeah, cheap exactly. to have to. Good, Mitchell, real quick. Lose those wall warts, use an anchor. Uh, go ahead, Jeffrey. And with good, uh, if you go and take a look at uh, Guitar Center, some of the guitarists have these little uh, board plugs that can uh, do multiple for 9 volt, for 12 volt, and lower. So you can uh, definitely check that out if you need to replace that or whatnot. 
Yeah, and you can definitely centralize a lot of those things, and a lot of them come with them. Like a yellow, like a, a yellow brick from Lynx or whatever has their own that you can just they they have it all built for those. So look for those because sometimes there's things that are already available to make that work. Uh, next question. Justin James in Phoenix, Arizona is asking, looking at building an X32 producer fly pack. Haven't found a rack or case that doesn't block front headphone jack. Any suggestions? I right, go ahead, Bill. Yeah, just to remote it with a little flat uh, right angle X, uh, right angle plug to a, a plug-in socket, and that should take care of it. Next question. From Guy Cochran in Seattle, Washington. Where is a good place online to research what other people have built? Go ahead, Jeff. Google, and then <laughs> Facebook. Facebook has a couple of groups called like Fly Pack, Fly Racks. I've gotten into those, and they're addictive. There's some really talented guys in there, and there's another one called Black Box Builders. Uh, Facebook groups. I highly recommend both of those. Lots of fun. Go it, Oliver. Uh, the Discord channel in the Office Hours Discord. Yeah, there's, and and we'll try to talk more about this. I think that, um, and if and if you. Um, if I, I don't see everything in Discord, but if you definitely, if you if you put my name in, I shouldn't say that on the thing, but I, I usually see those pretty quickly. Um, so, uh, but uh, but uh, I, there's a lot of people in this group. Um, obviously, you've seen Jeff and Bo and, and and Zach didn't get a lot of time to talk, but we're going to try to get him in more more often. Talk to him a little bit about it, uh, and Jeffrey and Oliver. So if we're all here, we're all there, uh, and Keenan um, and. Uh, I, I can, can I name all the people on the panel? Anyway, so we're all there um, often. And uh, and so you should definitely ask ask questions there. Um, we've I think a lot of us have have, have a lot of road scars <laughs> that we can share with you uh, to make that work. Uh, next question. Alexander Knight gets the last question from Vancouver, BC, Canada. What's a good monitor that you can put into a small rack case that slides out for multi-view? You know, there's a couple of them. There's um, they're 15 inch, uh, and oftentimes they're not 16 by nine. Um, so you'll find you'll see them if you do rack mountables. We've definitely had a lot of them. I don't. I, I, they drive me a little crazy, so I don't. I don't use a lot of them. But there's some that even have keyboards in them. They'll pop out with the keyboard, um, and we use them mostly so that we can remote into like um, the service input for like an elemental. <laughs> like that's what we use them for. They're like a PC VGA kind of setup. But we haven't found a lot of good ones that unrack that are again sixteen by nine. Go ahead, Jeff. The slide out ones are temporarily. Are, they're mostly they're designed for the IT world. They don't care about weight. So they're heavier too. They're made yeah. out of steel frames and all. I would not suggest doing that. I've found that those I've used them for years, tried to use them for years. They're great in theory, but usually the monitor itself is smaller. So you may yeah. like, like Alex was saying, it's only 15, it's that maybe 17, but they're really heavy and they just don't last. Uh, I, I suggest just a separate monitor in a case with the cables and just power it up whenever you need it. Uh, Lily put is one to search. They're Lilliput, Field World. A lot of those are just imported and rebranded in uh, the Amazon world. Uh, they're decent. They're not great, but they're decent if you want to try one of those. And I have to admit that we kind of moved to Jeff's point. They're not very good, <laughs> the ones that pull out. Uh, we have them as emergencies in our encoding racks because we needed to have a, P, you know, be able to remote into a, into a, um, a Linux box if we needed to. So we had them there, um, just make sure they never got separated, but almost all of it after that was external monitors that we um, oftentimes build mounts on the on the fly kit that we can just mount an arm and put put stuff on it. And we found that, that was way better to just be able to mount. Um, a lot of times they're the 17 inch, um, the 17 inch black magic monitors, but we can just mount them and put them out as wings or put three of them across and they, they show us a bunch of things. And it's just a lot better than um, pulling out the folding ones also are not necessarily very inexpensive either, you know, and so they're just they're they're um so it, it just it turned out to be a lot really, really cumbersome. So I locked those questions like a half an hour ago. That was a lot of that was a lot of discussion. It was funny because I I um I just had a couple of photos laying around and I and I told Josh that I was like, hey, why don't we just do a uh a, a fly kit <laughs> thing? And like I was just like, we 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 had couldn't decide what to do on Friday last week. And I, I thought, well, maybe someone will show up and and do it. And so um we didn't plan it very, very much. Um we should probably do these more often. Uh, so we'll probably talk about kits in different ways. Um and uh, maybe we, I could, I think we could probably do a whole one on big kits and probably a whole one on little kits. And uh, and so I think that that there's because there as you could see from this show, 
incredible range, you know, from, you know, from uh, storage containers. And we've had some after hours discussions where uh, talking about racetracks and and how to and how those things get get moved around. And, and so, uh, so there's a lot of, a um, lot of scale differences, and it's really fascinating uh, discussion. So anyway, so we'll talk more about it, especially now that all of us are going out into the real world again. Um, so, uh, so stay tuned for more of those. If you want more of these, or if you want them to be more specific, uh, go into discord and uh, put it in the second hour suggestions, like every other second hour suggestion. I just, so you know, I look at that almost every day. That was second hour suggestions. So it's big plus it. to have Oliver here and it could have been a first hour special guest. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, so, um, yeah, so, so definitely, um, rack those up and it's, uh, it was great, a great, uh, great hour, very dense uh, coverage there. Um, so anyway, good job. Good job to the producers for asking all the great questions. And thanks to the panelists. Of course, we can't do this without you. Uh, the real power of this panel is the fact that so many people with so many different backgrounds all show up, you know, and and um, we can answer that question from a bunch of different directions. You're not just hearing my opinion or somebody else's opinion. You're hearing all of our opinions and and and, and all of how we approach those things. And so um, I think that that get, and then you can choose what you what you'll want to listen to. So, um, so I think that it's a really, really powerful um, way that we put this together and, and you can see it. And I think this is a great, great hour. Anyway, so thanks, thanks to the panelists again. And thanks to the incredible crew that made this all work. There's a crew in the back end that's programming and building and designing and running this show uh, that you don't get to see, but there it's an amazing crew that keeps on keeps on growing. If you're interested, uh, you know, uh, there's some, I think there's going to be some volunteer forms. If you're interested in, in learning how we do all of this stuff, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty fascinating puzzle. Uh, uh, real quick, Michael Krasny will be, if you're in the Michael Krasny group, uh, he'll be, uh, we'll be doing an interview, um, later this morning. I'm, I'm going to go run and do that right now. <laughs> so, um, and, uh, and then, and uh, by the way, I won't be at whatever meeting we were going to have right after this, cause now we went way over and now my schedule is pinched. Um, the, uh, uh, also remember that we have an education hour tomorrow. So, um, so definitely uh, check that out as well. A lot of great educators coming together to, um, uh, to show those things. We traveled 105,000 miles. So we got a one K status today, 170,000 kilometers, uh, 957 million bananas for scale. So, um, so anyway, we we're very, pretty, pretty excited about the distance. I still think it's about 450 million minions, but, um, yeah, I, we, we don't know. We don't have that, that scale exactly correct yet. All right. Um, thanks so much. Uh, thank you. It was such a great, great to have all of you here in the panel and such a great set of questions. Really good day. All right. Let's go ahead and jump into after hours. So much. By the way, this works great at the Philly airport. <laughs> all I have to say is media on it and they'll go, okay, sure. And if you know that it's, it's, uh, it's a, it, in the old United system. It was star, star, G, uh, 25, star pound. was the code to get the media pass. Hey, welcome, Zach. Good to have you here. Zach, Zach please. Zach. Very quiet. Set up. Go ahead, push the button. Fan wag. And you can leave any time. Thanks, guys.